of this country. Now, a very eventful week it, it has been, and uh, as usual, some of the issues cannot escape the critical analysis required to push duty bearers to act. First, we shall deliberate on the possibility or otherwise for a road contractor to pay 1 million CDs bribe upfront before being awarded a contract to construct roads in Ghana. This issue is on our front burner because the alleger is not a mean person than a former appointee of the ruling government, Professor Stephen Adai. The Minister of Roads and Highways has been swift in responding to this damning allegation. It has asked the Economic and Organized Crime Office, Yoko, to get to the bottom of this accusation. Even before the investigation starts, the Contractors Association have also come in and saying Professor Adai's assertion is not factual. But then there's an admission that some monies are demanded by some people, but not to the tune of one million CDs that he, Professor Sivande, talked about. But take a listen to Professor Sivande. This road contract will be given to you, provided you put one million up front, or not that when you get your money. Then, and this is what a Kufuado must be thinking about. And if he knows about it, must be ashamed of that. Now his people demand from you a certain amount before you be considered for the job. Why? Because then when you, they get it, whether you, the government pays you or not, they have gotten their money. As if people are in a hurry to loot the country before the end of a Kufuadu's term. One of the greatest disappointment of uh, and Kufuado's regime is that, honestly, he raised the hope of Ghanaians. Ghanaians expected that we had gotten the leader with a vision, with the charisma, with the determination. And it seems if he doesn't redeem himself in the next 14 months, he will go down in history of the, one of the most disappointing leaders. And what the co corruption, the arrogance they think that there is Ghana is for them and that you know without them Ghana would not be there even think some of them thinking that they should tell us who should be our next president well that's Professor Stephen Adair there you know we would get into this matter because the road contractors have a narrative we're getting to it also Ghana Supreme Court headed by the Chief Justice Gertrude Arba Esaba Tokono has suffered some harsh words by the general public lately. Some have even described them as unanimous FC and so on over the period. Now, this has been a mere perception until one of them, who retired not too long ago, said appointment to the apex court should be based on merit, not cronyism and ethnicity. What does he know that we do not know? That's the focus of our discussion this morning on this matter. Take a listen to Professor, that's, uh, the, that's Justice William Atukuba, JSC, retired. Take a look. Question is not always whether it happens or not, but how to arrest it. And it to be arrested if the appointment process is transparent and genuine so that good and competent legal materials get onto the bench they have a reputation to to protect so they won't do certain things but i appeal to um, the lawyers that they should have mercy for the country also after making a lot of money over the years, now it should be time to come to the bench and serve the people. But not just money upon money upon money upon money uh, throughout like that. Because if anything, most lawyers now are locally trained. The schools you attended, from primary school through middle 
and then to university. Are they your family's private schools? The masters who taught you, your family paid them? Even the courts in which you go and practice and make your money, are they built by your family? Clearly you owe something back to the society as a whole. This shouldn't be ruled out like that. But I think these days, <clears throat> um, it's improving some lawyers of high standing, they accept appointment to the Supreme Court. But they know themselves. They know the dishonest ones. They know the genuine ones. So when it comes to time for appointment, and the bad nut is working his way of being proposed, they should move to block it. If we have competent and, you know, uh, respectable uh, people on the bench, corruption will die by itself. In the first place, the image, the reputation of the person will decide that you dare not go. And if you go, you will not succeed. After some time, people will get another hey, you come by just this way. Uh, then we'll be free. Hmm. Well, so we have three lawyers joining us this morning. There's a clarion call on them to serve the nation in other capacities. Finally, the woes of our compatriots in parts of the uh, Volta, Eastern and Greater Accra region uh, does not seem to, to abate. And we have been consistent in declaring our support for all of these brothers of ours, our compatriots. Um, uh, they are still reeling under the impact of the devastating floods that was caused by the spillage of the excess water from their consumer and the pond dams. Education and proper healthcare delivery are said to have been impacted. In fact, some of them are reported to be scrambling for relief items and that has brought to question the effectiveness in terms of coordination by the National Disaster Management Organization, NADMO. It appears does not seem to have a disaster management plan. Is that the case? Take a look. Uh, the past few days, we have actually even put a relief administration committee in place. That has all stakeholders uh, represented on the committee. We have the MP on it. We have the district chief executive on it. We have the traditional authorities, the two traditional authorities, okay. and uh, the other traditional authorities over bank on this committee. Mm. And we even have political parties on the committee because we try to represent all stakeholders and all shades of opinion on this committee right. so that these are, the, these are the people who oversee the distribution of uh, relief items that come in. So most of the relief items that come in now these committees are mostly present while these uh, items are received. There is uh, registration of uh, pregnant women, uh, uh, nursing mothers, the aged, and uh, uh, those with uh, disabilities. Uh, I actually, I think it is last week that I had the list of all the uh, dis disabled people in uh, people with disability in most of the camps and we actually did some allocation to all of them I think the number they brought was about 62 and we did some relief administration to them differently from what is done to the households on the safe uh, haven well this is not most narrative but later on the show I'm going to show you the the chaos that we witnessed at the St. Kizito safe haven in Mepe, the epicenter of this disaster. And that will tell a very, very worrying story and picture. We don't want to be a nation of no action and talk only. What do we do? What are the lessons that we have to pick going forward to ensure that things are done better the next time? These are be our key issues for this morning. I am out for the concept. Welcome. Right after this quick break, 
My guests will be joining me. We'll have a conversation this morning. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Melcom Super Saver Acida Promo, just the BKK. Enjoy a 15% discount on purchases worth 400 Ghana CDs and above from 11th October to 1st November 2023 at all Melcom stores nationwide. Present your Super Saver card to enjoy this discount. Discount is not valid on items already on promotion. To all our customers, you does see. Ah, terms and conditions apply. Melcom, we're gonna show. Dancing at 10 has been reloaded though. Oh yeah, I know that. that. Then the vibe is so vibing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, everyone needs to experience the vibe. And a Dancy at 10 Reloaded is definitely what you need this December. This time, we are sustaining the vibes in Qatar, Nairobi, Zanzibar, Singapore, Cyprus, Turkey, Philippines. From 20th November, at a rate starting from $1,990 per person and $3,950 for a couple. Your flight, accommodation, breakfast, and tours are all sorted. It's a Dancy at 10 Reloaded. Simply call 0595. 500-817 or 0556-310-404 to book now at Dancy Travels. Feel life's beauty. Where would you rather be than where your biggest opportunity is, is the question we continue to throw to the cinema world. Film House Group is proudly partnering with the National Film Authority of Ghana and our colleagues at Silverbed Cinemas to bring you a first of its kind business event for us to discuss the past, current and future prospects of cinema on the continent. Silverbed is so excited to be part of the first African Cinema Summit it's being hosted here in Ghana. We are so excited to receive the world and African stakeholders in the film ecosystem to engage in a common space where we come up with policies and strategies for the film growth in Africa. I think this event has been long in coming and this should have the full support of African governments. Just as we've recognized agriculture, just as we've recognized industry, we have to recognize the significance of the value that cinema can bring to our countries. The entire continent of Africa, of over 1.2 billion people, have less than 1,700 screens. And so the question we continue to throw out to cinema investors is where would you rather be than where your biggest opportunity is? Uh, this is nearly a hundred billion uh, dollar business, uh, estimated to grow significantly by 2030 to nearly 150, 160 billion. Ghana is excited to open the door for the rest of Africa to have this conversation with the world. Who can attend? Investors, exhibitors, distributors, governments, producers, studios, and many more. Go to our website and get all the information you need. Go to www.africacinemasummit.com. Why don't you mark this in your calendar? I certainly look forward to seeing you as we have the first ever cinema summit focused on Africa, happening in Africa. We can't wait to receive you here in our beautiful country, Ghana, and hear us say, Yemamo Akwaba. See you there in Accra, November 14 to 16. The Ghana Journalists Association welcomes you to the 27th GJA Media Awards, a night of networking and recognizing achievements themed leveraging media freedom to sustain the democratic and security architecture. The litmus test of election 2024. Keynote speaker, Mrs. Jean Mensah, Chairperson, Electoral Commission, Chairman, Reverend Dr. Ernest Dujemfi, Chairman, National Peace Council, Special Guests of Honor, Honorable Opon Krumah, Minister for Information, and 
and Her Excellency Virginia E. Palmer, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana. Join us at the 27th GJA Media Awards as we celebrate excellence at the Accra International Conference Center, Sunday, October 29th, 2023, 3 p.m. sharp. Lead sponsor, GCB Bank, major sponsors, U.S. Embassy, KGL, Ghana Gas, ADB Bank, Yoko, and Tobinko. Supporting sponsors, Ghana Police Service, Stambig Bank, Access Bank, GBC, National Security, Kapoha, SNIT, Innerlink, and Ghana Shippers Authority. Powered by the GJA and Glow Productions. This Sunday on Hot Issues. Dr. Bawamia, Vice President, who many within the party, including some of those contending uh, in the presidential primary, say he is the establishment candidate. As General Secretary of the party, together with our national chairman and national officers, we, are, we have never at any point in time been coerced. We have never at any point in time been suggested to mm. or before to support a particular candidate. It would seem that the party now um, has made peace with the fact that Alan has left. Well, it's, it's a very unfortunate. We can't continue to cry over his belt. But for us as a party, we are, we are focused towards the November 4th presidential time. That is our goal for now. For every political party, we are, we are not angels. We are not saints. When there is a contest, certainly there will be some level of interaction. Hot Issues shows Sundays at 2 p.m. on TV3. TV3, first in news. Have you ever been bullied? They desire other things that the other person have that they do not have. And what did you do about it? Go back home and you speak to mommy about it. If you want to know more about this, watch this week's Katerina. And our discoverer of the week is somebody that you see on all the commercials. Anelam, why didn't you come to school yesterday? Tune into this week's Kids Arena right here on TV3 at 10am. Kids Arena, this is us. Kids Arena, this is us. Kids Arena, show Saturdays at 10 a.m. on TV3. Don't miss it. Do you want to be a star? You saw them in pairs as they dazzled you with extraordinary musical skills last Sunday. It's an amazing performance. This week, they stand alone to give you a taste of what they know how to do best on the mental stage. Here, yeah, all 16 contestants will perform great renditions of music from their own choosing. It's the freestyle edition for TV3 Mental Season 12. Catch the Mentor Season 12 show live this and every Sunday at 8 p.m. on TV3. TV3 Mentor Season 12. The world awaits you. Mentor is brought to you by Heaven Black Insecticide Spray and Mosquito Coil and Napa Foods, Sense Body Spray, Bell Ice, Vitamilk, Dragnet. Now, this phenomenal guest of ours this week on Today's Woman needs absolutely no introduction. If you take yourselves too seriously, mm. if you think that this is the end of it, that is when there's a challenge. Mm. So don't think that if you don't get it now, it's ended. It's ended. It's mm. the end of it all, mm. right? Mm. Another opportunity is going to come. If you are not intentional, if you don't plan, and if you don't execute, mm. your wishes mm. will be what they are. Wishes. So you need to be intentional mm. in every facet of your life. Just make sure that you're tuned in and glued to your TV set this Saturday at exactly 3 p.m. on TV3 with me, Cookie, and Comfort Okra. Today's Woman with Cookie Tea show Saturdays at 3 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Latex Foam. This call. A man who has seen his fiancée's auntie in a negative light. His mom is nothing to write home about. They are all over the place doing things that married women are not supposed to do. The message I saw was that the man said he didn't enjoy her the last time they had sex. <laughs> mm. You mean your mother-in-law? Yes, please. Not your fiancé? Not my fiancé. Since her mom is already into such acts, I don't know what advice she's going to give to her daughter. In psychology, there are two aspects mm. that actually raise, that causes people to behave the way they do, nature mm -hmm. and nurture. When it comes to family traits, 
the ladies parents and auntie are fornicators we agree mm -hmm. now baba have you checked your background I, I think that it is god showing him mercy by giving him that grace to even get scared and yeah. sex is not love if sex were love nobody would divorce mm. because in sex you have 24 7 to shut down on everything close the door mm. and do the thing <laughs> Confessions shows on Saturdays at 9.30 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by MTN. This is the new season of your number one cooking show, McBrow's Kitchen. Watch us on TV3. 5 to 6 p.m. Every Saturday. McBrow's Kitchen. A Johnny McBrow's Kitchen. A Johnny McBrown's Kitchen shows this and every Saturday at 5 p.m. on TV3. Welcome back to Key Point here on TV3. We're live on 3FM 92.7, also on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. My guests joining me in studio, uh, Professor Enoch Enchi is a governance and leadership expert, and then also the dean of the business unit at the Academic City University, Professor Enoch Enchi. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Alfred. I'm thrilled to be here as always. Also, Martin Pebo is private legal practitioner. Uh, leader of one of two individual Bonoga groups and also the convener for the Kumi Prekurilo, the demonstration. Lawyer Martin Pebo is joining us on Zoom today. Uh, Lawyer Martin Pebo, good morning. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Kansi. Morning. Oh, okay. Good to be here. Okay. Great. Bobby Bunsen is also a private legal practitioner and a lecturer at the Ghana School of Law, what you call Makola. Lawyer Bobby Bunsen. Good morning and welcome. Good morning and thank you for having me. Great. It's good to have you as always. Uh, if you can put your, your, your video on for me, that will be good. And then we'll be joined shortly by Alhaji Nusafuseni. He is a private legal practitioner as well and a former minister in a number of portfolios, including one that we will talk about this morning. He'll be joining us in a bit. Dennis Miracles Abuaji is also a presidential staffer. He's also going to be joining us here on Key Point. But this is what Justice William Atuguba, retired, said. Take a look. It says, appointments to the judiciary or any other government or governance institution must be made by thoroughly independent, the emphasis on thoroughly independent bodies based on nothing but merit. Based on nothing but merit. This is view. It says, and not on things like protocol, cronyism, uh, ethnicity or any other improper considerations and you heard him earlier when I, I played that insert that a lot more in terms of the qualities that uh, should be looked out for of a lawyer should come to bear than at least what we are seeing and corruption itself will be dealt with if such considerations are made. Uh, Alajin Safsin is joining us. In studio. Alaj, good morning, welcome. Yeah, good morning, how are you? Oh, well, thank you. Good. It's good, good to have you. Like, I'll start off with you. Um, lawyer Martin Pebo. First of all, let's understand really what, was, what was, were the considerations of the framers of our constitution um, in putting Article 144 in there, which we'll be, we'll be looking at shortly giving the powers to appoint judges to the various levels of the court. I mean, from, from at least the, the, the Supreme Court and then also we've, as we've seen the High Court as well, to the president, who is the head of another arm of government. 
giving the authority to appoint the head of another arm of government, the judiciary, obviously in consultation with the Council of State and the Judicial Council in some instances. What was the thinking behind Article 144? Great. Okay. So, Mr. Kansi, you know, this uh, constitution that we have is a culmination of previous constitutions from 1960 till date, right? So, they, and it's been in vogue, and not only in Ghana, that usually the president would have the power to appoint judges of the superior court. So, as you rightly said, High Court, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court. That's been the style. As I said, you go to the UK, now, this, uh, not even now, it's, it's been like that, okay? They, they have a committee, okay? That's chaired by the Lord Chancellor, but usually the uh, queen has a role but of course they are thoroughly independent yes you read some of the cases that they have they are said that look they are not in the uk they say they are not employees of the uh queen no they are independent and independent arm of government though you have the lord chancellor and those other people playing the role you go to the us they say you see so you remember donald trump appointed some supreme court judges Right, and then before Obama left, he wanted to appoint uh, Garland, very Garland, but there were issues. The Republicans blocked him. So in the U.S., the uh, president also appoints Supreme Court judges and some of the uh, and the Court of Appeal judges. Right. So you go to other countries. That has been it for, I mean, God knows how long. But the thing is that, as you are seeing, we appear to have copied blindly. Because whereas in these countries, there are so many things that help to make the institution independent. Ghana, we didn't have that. And so, I hope I'm not running ahead of myself. You heard recently the Chief Justice complain that even though the president had boosted that he, he had increased funding to anti-corruption agencies, that Shraj, uh, uh, OSP, etc. The judiciary got just 3%. So you see that the chief justice said to underpin the independence of the judiciary, they would need to be financially independent. And that's not the only time. Uh, also, at the vetting of the chief justice, Justice Tokonu, she made it clear that she doesn't want the president to have a role in the discipline of judges because in that way, you know, Article 146 of the Constitution, I think Justice Atukuba touched a bit on that, and that's the 146 of the Constitution. The president has a role in the discipline of judges. I'm sure we'll come into further details. So you see that, yes, our framers. So that's how come when you say what, so coming back to what underpinned it. Though uh, lots of uh, NDC uh, stores are denying it, but generally we accept that this our Constitution was a compromise to get Rawlings to. Uh, you know, allow for the return of a democratic rule. So I'm aware that this particular statement that the constitution is a compromise, it was done to appease uh, ex-president Rawlings for him to go uh, return Ghana to democratic rule. People have denied it. I know uh, Dr. Tony, if he hears us this morning, I'm sure Mr. Okan he will ask uh, uh, Mr. Kwamina Atu Hazel to put him on so that he can debunk it. Yes. Dr. Uh, uh, Tony Edu can deny it and the rest, but we largely accept that this constitution was done in a way to appease Rawlings. Otherwise, we wouldn't have some of those provisions. I see now we are suffocating under it. So independence in our constitution, uh, that the independence of the judiciary has not been properly guaranteed. And as I said, Justice Tokonu's uh, recent uh, statements and which are laudable and we must allow the chief justice for being this bold that look it doesn't matter that it's president Kufuado who appointed there but she's interested in reforms that would make the judiciary truly independent so that's a problem our constitution doesn't really guarantee as much the independence of the judiciary as one would have thought so practically it is not though in the you see final judicial power at one two five and the rest belongs to the court and the rest now before uh this uh, you you're able to give final judicial power don't forget you need resources buildings 
judges, etc., the appointment processes and everything before final judicial power can be very meaningful. So we really don't have that, that kind of uh, practical independence as much as we all would wish. So you would have situations where government would withhold funds from the judiciary. It's very commonplace to find that sometimes a lot of the allowances for months on end don't mm -hmm. get paid to the judiciary. So when you do this, what do you do to the judiciary? You weaken them because it has a chilling effect. Because whilst the chief justice is trying to lobby finance ministry to make payments and the rest, you know that in, in that process, it, it really weakens the judiciary. Though you see in the constitution, the same, uh, the, uh, one of the articles, the uh, 178, there are about that the budget should be presented to parliament independently. But practically, Minister of Finance, and that's the president, has a say in trying to cut down. So these mm. are my preliminary uh, comments. And, and you, you see, you're right about the historical antecedent to this, to this issue. This is not the first time this matter is coming up. And it may not be the last until whatever considerations we have is made in terms of amendment to this Article 144. But to the extent that it keeps coming up and is now being suggested by people of high and good standing who have served at the apex court, the likes of William Tukuba GSC, retired now, also adding his voices to their voices to the likes of CDD and other civil society organizations that have made these suggestions clearly indicates that there's, there's, there's something that has to be addressed in there because if all was well and, and things were playing out as, as expected, this will not even come up as a conversation in the first place. Let's look at Article 144 um, just to, to establish some basis. Um, we, we can put Article 144 of the 1902 Constitution on the screen right. It says, 1441, the Chief Justice shall be appointed by the President acting in consultation with the Council of State and with the approval of Parliament. So these are the levels. The, Supreme, the other Supreme Court justices shall be appointed by the President acting on the advice of the Judicial Council. You see, there's a change in there. In consultation with the Council of State and with the approval of Parliament. Justices of the Court of Appeal and of the High Court and Chairman of the Tribunal the regional tribunal shall be appointed by the president acting on the advice of the judicial council and then these are the the levels and the various consultative bodies in the process of appointing this the the chief justice and the the other justices at the various levels of the court well martin people based on what you have said earlier, and I'm going to bring you a little bit in a bit. Would you say that mm -hmm. the considerations that the, the framers of the Constitution had has outlived its usefulness because of the evolution of our democracy and, and the nature of our politics? Maybe a second look would have to be taken at this 144 going forward. Me, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that one is very clear. So you see, like I said, let's keep going back. It's not even only one four four. We're also looking at one four six. So absolutely, we want to change. So you see, and it's good you, you even reference CDD that they are also at the forefront. We want that true independence. And so it's clear that look, Mr. Kansi, going into 2024, after the economy, the next. Uh, what do you call it, political uh, this promise, has to be about uh, a vast and substantial amendment of the constitution. Because we are suffocating. So this is one of the provisions that we are championing that we should what, amend so that we take the power away from the president. So you see that uh, the Supreme Court has tried a bit to cut down the powers of the president. There was the case of the GBA versus um, Attorney General. Mm -hmm. You know, when Justice um, uh, Puaman, yes, Justice Puaman was nominated to the Supreme Court and some other judges were left out. Um, that's, I think, Mensa Bunsu and mm -hmm. then uh, the one who passed away, Mafu Sam. Yes, the GBA went to court to say that, look, so the one, the 1442, you read, the other Supreme Court judges, 
the president appoints them on the advice of the judicial council right so the supreme court made an inroad though not many lawyers are referring to it but when you read the decision they made an inroad this is what they said so they themselves are showing that they are not happy with it so they said look okay it's the president who, who uh, uh, appoints even though we usually say he's not bound by the advice right in a way that is not true it's no longer true we, we don't understand that decision what they said was that listen if the judicial council advises the president that these are the people we think you should appoint and you don't agree right so you see that list then you can't also uh, what do you call it go outside it so when we are ready, one two three you cannot take let's say number three and leave out one and two you can't go outside it so mr can say let's repeat with all the force we can master the supreme court has made an inroad in this appointment and trying to clip the president a, a, a bit right so mm -hmm. that subsequently you can't just look at the list pick and choose any that you like and go outside yes they are number they are one two three four <coughs> excuse me, five then you the president may look at it and say oh he likes number five and then he takes only number five and then he's gone no no that's been clipped a bit so the point we're making is that so the, the the main thing i want to bring to bear on this conversation is that so you see that the supreme court itself is not happy with the appointment powers of the president and they've made that loud and clear in that gba case they've made that loud and clear and recently you had Justice Duce. Yes, it's also, it was also front page, uh, daily graphic. He said the president has too many powers. We have to amend to cut down. So if you go on and on and on, you would see that people, I mean, not just the, uh, the ordinary citizens, but the judiciary itself. Yes, because you look at the GBA case. So that time, Professor Mesa Bonsu and Mafu San were left out. The president, the president, Mama at the time, yes, didn't take them. And that's how come GPA went to court. And as I said, though, you won't say they lost totally, because for me, it was a great inroad that at least now when there's that list like that, you can't just, uh, if you say you don't like the list, no, but you can't also just go out and go and pick just in a hat, okay, when they've brought you a list. So they've clipped the powers a bit. And as I'm saying, Clipping the pies a bit, I'm looking at the message behind. You think if the Supreme Court was very happy that the president should just appoint willy-nilly, when they bring him a list, he can throw it into the dustbin and just choose any people that he wants, anyhow, they would have said so. But you see that, no, they weren't. They tried to be respectful, but you see that at the end, they came to a clear conclusion that, Master, don't do this. You cannot just look at the list, one, two, three, and then you just go outside it like that. Mm -hmm. So if you say you are not bound to take it, then you too, you don't have the freedom. So don't forget, the president too cannot just ignore their list and go and bring somebody totally different. You see, so mm -hmm. by at least the judicial council presenting a list, in a way it clips the president. And so we should be throwing the search light also on the judicial council to see that at any point that they are doing it, they are also being independent. Because look, Mr. Kansi, let's say it very loud and clear. In some of the institutions, you see the power to nominate comes from them. And very soon I've been coming to the National Media Commission for us to draw the parallel. But in practice, you find that when you have a certain president in power, and uh, this belongs to a certain political party, there are ways informally that they will go and lobby the commission members etc to choose certain persons that the president likes so you see that indirect on paper you may see that it's the commission that would so when i talk about nmc they should appoint their own chairman remember uh yeah uh, uh, right yes that kind of thing but informally before the elections they will lobby 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 and then it will end up being somebody the president prefers anyway so the point is that Paper alone is not enough. We also need to build strength and character in mm -hmm. the people in the positions. There is a lot to be said that we need strength and character. If the people in the positions are very malleable, so I'm talking about uh, this, the various commissions and the council, then you would end up with the same. All the president has to do is indirectly go behind and lobby them. 
and then they will end up bringing candidates that he likes and then he's gone so as we are talking about amending this constitution revising it some are saying we need a new constitution all of it let's not forget his character a lot depends on the character of the right. Ghanaian. if we continue to be docile and malleable oh don't forget it you will see the paper guaranteeing everything mm. but practically the president and his people will go behind and lobby the people and they'll end up doing exactly what he wants then we'll be back to square one okay well Martin, people thank you let me uh, precisely uh, from, from the governor's perspective, at least over the time we've seen um, the Afrobarometer survey and the likes all indicate the the mistrust for the judiciary, and, and it is evident not just with Afrobarometer and also other other rankings or research suggesting that a lot more questions are being asked of the independence of the judiciary as we speak. Professor, uh, sorry. Justice William Atukuba made this point, amongst other things, during that lecture at the University of Ghana Political Science Department. He says, quote, you want the judiciary to be independent. The Constitution states so. Nonetheless, on the Judicial Council, which recommends justice to be appointed, the, the executive is heavily represented there. Where and how can the independence of the judiciary be achieved? So, is this a concern that especially you align with us because of the fundamental issues about the, the independence of the judiciary and how that influences the conduct of that arm of government. Thank you, Alfred. I think uh, his point is very clearly made. If you appoint somebody, automatically the person is responsible or accountable to you. And that is what he's talking about. Let's take a look at the Judicial Council and even the Council of State. So the Judicial Council have got these members, the Chief Justices, you know, the chair of it. And then we have uh, somebody from the Justice of the Supreme Court, also appointed by the president. We have uh, the attorney general, who was also appointed by the president. We have the justice of the Court of Appeal, a rep there, also appointed by the president. We also have uh, somebody representing the high court, also appointed by the president. We have the lower bench, somebody also representing that, also appointed by the president. And then we have, uh, the immediate past president of the Ghana Bar Association, which is an independent body that we all agree. Then we have somebody from the Ghana Armed Forces, also the, the influence is coming from the president. Mm -hmm. Then we have Osi Adiyewe Kumfia Meyao, Techima, in representing the, the, you know, the House of Chiefs, that we can say is also quite independent. But then we also have other government appointees, which is a uh, government appointee, Madam Elizabeth Ohine, Dr. Rose Mensah Kutin, also government appointee. So four government appointees, and then we have the secretary. Of, so you can see that the members of that council, you know, the digital council, mm -hmm. you have almost two thirds of it appointed by the president. And if that is the way, it is skewed. So how independent are you if you are appointed by the president? If you go to any organization and you look at the hierarchy of it, once you report you know, there's a hierarchy, clear division of labor, mm -hmm. where you report to your superior. Yes. Now, if you are appointed by somebody and you report to the person, because Article 146 talk about even the president getting involved in disciplining some of the justices of the Supreme Court. Mm. So, because of that, what uh, William Atubiga said is really clear, that we can never have that kind of independence when most of them at the council are appointed by the president. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we have some elected individuals there. Anytime there's an appointment, we have a skewed judgment of the president. Now let's go into the nitty gritties of some of the things he talked about. Protocol. Anytime we have protocol, it gives advantages to some individuals in the society. So I propose that we abolish our protocol system in Ghana from education system to the Supreme Court where even in education, somebody goes to a secondary school based on protocol. Mm -hmm. So if I sat in a village under the, the, the moon and I learned, then I'm able to get some aggregate. But somebody who sat in Accra at a comfort, they, they, they were fed three times meals a day, and that person did not get a good grade, but because that person knows somebody who is influential in society, that person is given a protocol, and that protocol gets somebody into an institution where they don't merit to be there. So we, we are using the word marriage as a judgment word. Mm -hmm. So protocol is something that we should abolish in Ghana. Everybody should be on equal footnote. We should treat everybody equally. So protocol 
doesn't help in the judiciary. The second thing you talk about is cronyism. Anytime you appoint friends, you know, people from your church, people from your tribe, to the, you know, so to the Supreme Court, you are talking about lack of efficiency. Cronyism really uh, leads to lack of efficiency because the person do not qualify to be there. And that is why we have a lot of square pegs in round holes. Then we're talking about ethnicity, which divides us. So most of the things that he talked about is really, and then improper considerations. Somebody was a chamber member. As we speak now, there are a couple of people who were in the same chamber with the president, and they had a Supreme Court. So is it, you know, because he knew them? What about those who could not get opportunity to be in the same chamber with the president? Why are we not considering them? So I think that we should look at the council, uh, the judicial council, we should look at that. The same way that I've talked about, we should look at the council of state. Look at the way it's appointed. You know, it's also skewed. So we have given a lot of powers to the president, even parliament, that is supposed to approve the Supreme Court justice. Parliament don't have a bite. Our parliament don't have a bite. Why? Say they don't have because a bite. the what same constitution says that over 50% of parliamentarians can be appointed as ministers. So where he lies the checks and balances and separation of powers. So when everybody goes to the chamber, they are not trying to catch the eye of the speaker, but trying to catch the eye of the president. Because when you speak for the president, then he can appoint you as a minister. What happens to that? If everybody is getting 250 street lights, if you're a minister, you get double that. You get 500 street lights. So everybody wants to catch the eye of the president. So we've made our president this constitution so powerful in all the appointments in such a way that the spirit and letter of our constitution is suffering. And that is what my friend lawyer Kwebu talked about. We are suffocating mm -hmm. under this constitution, and we should review it. And in fact, you talk about, he actually mentioned something related to governance. At this point, let me welcome Dennis Miracles Abuaji. He is with us. Dennis, good morning. Good welcome. And thank you for having me. Now, uh, on, on, the, on governance, because this is your, your turf and, and arena of, of, of expertise, uh, Professor MP, he says governance institutions particularly the judiciary, must be realistically insulated, the emphasis on realistic insulation, against presidential and other political pressures. And this is not talking specifically about, about this president, because he makes references to what's happened in the past and what's happening now. Service conditions must be reasonably attractive, and security of tenure of office must be enshrined. So even though you see that the, the process of appointment has some demand of the president making consultations with certain bodies. Justice Atuguba retired makes a strong point about how realistic the judiciary in terms of its independence is because these consultative bodies do not in any way in his view realistically insulate the judiciary of, of the executive power. I always give this example from Tibet. You know, Tibet is a country that has not achieved independence. And if you talk to, I've met the Dalai Lama a couple of times, and he talks about, you can see that if we enjoy democracy, that's the supreme thing you can, the independence. If you are in a relationship and you are not independent, of course, you will leave, right? If you are in an institution working for them and you are not independent to make your own judgment, you will leave. So we can see that a lot of public institutions now are suffocating talking from the IGP's area, the, the, the military area, and I've had a lot of talks that we don't have time to talk about, explain those things, but mm -hmm. if you are working in an institution and you don't have the independence to think of your own, but you have to play to the tune of the master, the appointee who appointed you, of course, your efficiency is crippled. You cannot perform. So when he's talking about how to protect our democracy, that was the topic he was talking about, and then the role of the judiciary. Every institution in the world, from America to Europe, I'm talking about North America, mm -hmm. US and then Canada. If you look at them, the biggest pillar of them is the law. So every system, the biggest pillar is the law. That is why if the judiciary suffers, we all suffer. We need the judiciary to be independent minded so that they can execute, you know, interpret the law through the spirit and the letter of it. Mm -hmm. I am an author of many leadership books. Indeed. When I write a book, I have the spirit and the, you know, the letter of my book. Nobody can use my book to teach better than I do, even though most of my books are textbook in US. The reason is that there is something that moved me to write it. So the, the framers of our constitution, something moved them to. But look at even the US constitution. It says that nine justices in the US Supreme Court 
should be appointed. But our constitution is that not less than nine other justices, apart from the Supreme Court. So we just copied this and put it there. But the framers of US constitution, this is what they saw. They realized that the weakest link of the three arms of government was the judiciary. Even US, the original framers of this, this constitution, they realized that the judiciary is the, the weakest. Why? In 2010, I almost ran for mayor uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, because mm -hmm. I was again assistant president there. And uh, what happened is that Obama decided to go for the LGBT, all this. The idea when I joined Obama's campaign was that we we're going to work for within the first 100 days, look for uh, amnesty for illegal immigrants. We had 11.5 million illegal immigrants in US, including some of his aunties from Kenya. And then we wanted to work on that. But then those, if you come to Columbus, Ohio, almost half of the cities, the zip code is owned by the LGBT community. They are powerful, they have money. So they decided to sponsor some of Obama's campaign. And what happened was that they took all of us who were contesting for leadership in the Democratic Party. We were all in Cleveland, Ohio, for almost six months, Center for Progressive Leadership. And they started talking about Proposition 18. Proposition 18 was the LGBT thing. That is when it started. Then they decided to go to the House, and then it did not pass. Mm -hmm. They decided to go to the whole country. That means that you have to do vote for yes or no and trend part of the Constitution, yes or no. And that you need 25 states to vote yes. And then after that, we go to a referendum. Now, mm -hmm. the first state was California, and they voted no. So he realized that that's not going to work. So what did he do? He went to the Supreme Court where there are only nine judges, convinced five out of the nine, and the next day America woke up accepting the LGBT community. So you can see that because the numbers are limited in the judiciary, any president who stuck his, you know, his favorites there can really have a lot of things that is happening. And that is why we have an issue in this country where we said that even your birth certificate, and this is coming from our Supreme Court, your birth certificate is not accepted, you know, but then the passport and the Ghana card is accepted for you to vote. Now, look at this. The birth certificate is a primary. It's a primary document that you use to make your passport, right? Mm -hmm. You use to make your passport and then the Ghana card. Now, we are saying that the secondary document, rather, is accepted, but the primary document is not accepted. But that is how the law interpreted it. Now, somebody living in the U.S. or Europe will say that, look, if you said that from your Supreme Court, then you are telling us that your birth certificate is 40. So if the primary document is 40, then automatically the secondary document should be 40 as well. So we should look at, when you talk about character, leadership is receiving your character in action. So character is key in drafting our constitution. And the character of people that we put into the Supreme Court, everybody the president appoints reflects on his judgment. Well, President Chia, I'll, I'll come to you. And since uh, Justice William Atukoba, GSC retired, is making recommendations about an independent body making these appointments going forward. Let's think through which independent bodies can, can do this. Well, but because, a judicial council. Uh, well, well, we'll see. But judicial council, I'll tell you why he also raised questions about whether the judicial council is the, is the most appropriate body to do this. But uh, Lawyer Bobby Banson, uh, I bring you in here at this point because, and on the back of that recommendation of the, the reference to the judicial council, because if you look at 1441, the president nominates Okay, and not appoint. The president nominates these persons, correct? Uh, for, for instance, the chief justice in consultation with the Council of State and the Judicial Council. What Justice William Matukuba talks about with the Judicial Council is that in the composition of the Judicial Council itself, which recommends justices to be appointed by the president, you have the Attorney General and four other nominees of the president sitting on this judicial council, taking part in proceedings as to who should be presented for appointment to the Supreme Court. So really, how independent are they? Good morning, Alfred. Um, good morning to um, fellow panelists in studio and joining by Zoom. I have listened a lot to the uh, submissions by senior table and uh, read extensively the speech by the very, very respected and learned 
Justice Atuguba. I, I think this issue of judicial independence is not new. It's something that has been touted a lot and raised, not only in Ghana, but everywhere that we have the kind of system that we are practicing. Um, even in America and in the UK, there have been serious issues of questions about judicial independence in the same context. But the, the question that we have, I always ask myself when this happens is what is the alternative? What do we do? Um, how do we go about it? I, I would want to put the discussions in a particular context, and I hope that you would have the time to allow me to do that. First, I, 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 I do not think it is fair for us to associate the work of the, or the, let me start by this. I don't think it's fair to associate the judiciary only to the Supreme Court. The judiciary is not only the Supreme Court. There is the district court, there is the circuit court, there is the high court, there is the court of appeal before there is the Supreme Court. And so the, the work of the judiciary does not happen alone with the Supreme Court. And so when we hear the narrative that the judiciary is not independent because the president appoints or nominates for appointment members of the Supreme Court, then I ask myself, what about the court of appeal? What about the high court? the district court and the uh, circuit court, that actually dispense more ju justice to the ordinary Ghanaian than what the Supreme Court does. I mean, on the everyday basis, the person in the village whose tomato has been stolen would go to the district court and not come, or is likely to go to the district court and not come to the Supreme Court. And so for them, the judiciary, as we are speaking about now, as if it is essentially the Supreme Court, is not. And, and, and I think that we should make that analysis or that distinction. And secondly, the Supreme Court does not only discharge, for lack of a better word, even though they say we should not use that term, politically inclined cases or cases of constitutional interpretation. The Supreme Court deals with appeals. They deals with cases of um, um, inter in, in, um, interpreting the Constitution. Senior Martin Tebu, who I always uh, uh, refer to, went to the Supreme Court for some very, very germane uh, constitutional interpretation that affected the fundamental human rights of all of us. And so I do not even think that the constitutional or the so-called political cases that the Supreme Court engages in is even more, and I stand to be corrected, I stand to be corrected, is even up to 30% of the work of the Supreme Court. And so to, to suggest or to always give the narrative as if the Supreme Court exists to do the so-called political cases or to a large extent the constitutional interpretation cases, I think it's a bit problematic because the role of the Supreme Court to dispense justice is not limited to those constitutional cases. The reason why I'm saying this is that you see the politicians as we have it do not make up majority of the populace of Ghana. And so to say as if the judiciary as it were exists to do the bidding of the executive, which is the political class, it's very unfair because you have the ordinary persons who every day want to go to a justice system where they have the confidence in. And so if we have the political elite and some of us who have access to some of these platforms suggest entirely that the judiciary is not independent, mainly based on an argument on the fact that there have been one or two decisions or um, statements in the past from persons within and without the judiciary or outside the judiciary that suggests there were some form of influence, then it becomes problematic because if, if Dennis Miracle Abwaji, who is a political appointee, wants to go to the Supreme Court for constitutional interpretation, we all know that he belongs to the MPP. And then if there is an outcome now that favors his cause, we are going to say, okay, is it because he's an MPP? And the current chief justice was appointed by the MPP, and that is why he had a favorable report. No, but to the to the ordinary man on the street, justice delivery has absolutely very little to do with constitutional interpretation. And so we should be careful the way we seek to generalize the independence of the judiciary solely on the basis that they do constitutional cases. Alfred, can you hear me? I, I, I can hear you clearly. Okay, mm -hmm. then the second point I would, I, I, I would like to make, that in this dispensation and in dispensations of the past, the Supreme Court has delivered decisions that went against the certain government. And, and, and we, we have to speak about those things. And I think that it is not fair to the Supreme Court judges. In recent times, 
The Attorney General went to court for that um, narcotics amendment to the narcotics law, I think, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Asking, yes. And the, the judge that wrote, and I'm making this point because of what Prof said, that there are uh, members of the, or former members of the chambers of the president who are the Supreme Court. And so the perception that they, would, they, 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 they have been there because of their relationship with the former president in their professional lives is there. But I just want to, want to draw this, this, the, his attention to this. That narcotics case, the attorney general, who was also in that same chambers, with the former president or the president's, the president's chambers, went to court asking for an amendment of the narcotics act, which to the layman would essentially legalize the cultivation and sale of, of we, right? That is how we, we, we understand that, that application to me. You know, the person who wrote the lead judgment refused or dismissing the case of the attorney general? It was Justice Yoni Kolendi. And Justice Yoni Kolendi was from the president's chambers. Together with, the, I don't know whether they were there at the same time, but that attorney general was also there. And yet he delivered a judgment that dismissed the case of the attorney general. And this is in this dispensation. And so I shudder when I hear people generalize the view as if, and this, this was a policy of the government that they intended to raise funds and do, we have government appointees that were on air, and the attorney general even went on review, I think so. The attorney general went on review and still lost mm -hmm. on that same case. And so it is not as if that the, 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 the current Supreme Court or the past Supreme Court, and I am, I am not as old in the profession as, as those who have spoken would be yet, but with my little reading of the current dispensation, it is not as if they completely told the line of the executive. I do not see it like that. So those are some of the comments that I would want to make so that we situate the discussions in that particular context. Now, I always come back to ask the question, what is the alternative? As we have it now, the Supreme Court judges, to my understanding, are nominated by the president. That's what it upon is. Upon with all the uh, institutions, constitutional institutions, or institutions that have been stated in the constitution. And the nominations are taken to parliament for parliamentary approval. Now we know parliament is a representation of the people. Mm -hmm. Parliamentarians are there on partisan lines. Mm -hmm. And yet the constitution says that when the president nominates, it is parliament that if parliament refuses to approve your nomination, the president cannot appoint you. And so if we have any institution that we must hold accountable more than another, when it comes to ensuring the independence of the judiciary, I think we should consider the legislature as well. You mean because parliament for that matter. Parliament, but yes, but can, can, can parliament be, just as you indicated, the, the partisan nature of parliament, uh, even though the Supreme Court, in fact, the, the constitution gives them that mandate as well to approve uh, these nominations or the persons nominated, can they be, based on their partisan nature of their work, trusted to do that work of approving persons not on partisan lines but looking at their competence and the the, the merit that they bring to to bear because you underscore the partisan nature of the of of, of parliament in itself yes uh, Alfred, that was the point i was coming to that is the price we have decided to pay for our democracy as a people the democratic dispensation that we have and this is not to say that there's no need for reform. I'm not saying that. The democratic system that we chose to have, and in every other country that we are practicing, is based on partisan politics. You are elected based on the policies that you present to the people. The people are happy with your politics, and they choose you in place of another person. And when they choose you, they give you the mandate that whatever decision you take in the next four years, or eight years, or five years, should be in the best interest of the people. If they are not happy with that decision, then they have the obligation to go back and then vote you out. And I always use this example. When the, 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 the most recent, I think, the most recent nominations by the president to parliament, there were some Supreme Court judges whose nominations were reserved and approved later. You remember? Yes, the two of them. Yes, yeah, but... and there were arguments that one of them 
had represented a certain political party at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Now, when he, his nomination came up and those discussions came up, there was a block for, and this is me, uh, public, I, again, I stand to be corrected, a block of his region where he came from, which is predominantly belonging to the opposing political party, said that, no, 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 no. As it stands now, they do not have persons from that region at the apex court. And so whatever it takes, they will push through to have one, one of their own at the Supreme Court. And that is where we are. And that was the truth. And so okay. if Parliament had decided not to approve his nomination, for instance, then what would that president have done? The president couldn't have done anything. But once Parliament decides to approve those nominations, why do you go back to blame the president? In any event, in any event, the constitution itself also provides for means by which judges at the superior courts of judicature, I know the procedure for the high court is different from the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. can be removed on proven grounds. Even if the ordinary citizen submits a petition and there's prima facie case. And so even though we all wish that we have an, a judiciary that would not be accused of the things that persons are accusing them of now, I think that one, we should not overgeneralize the situation because it does not erode only the confidence of the political elite towards the judiciary. It erodes the confidence of the ordinary person. And ordinary people are more than the politicians. And that is the danger that I think that generalizing such discussions would, would bring. And we should not. Okay. I'm not saying we should not criticize it. I'm not saying we should not raise issues. Mm -hmm. But I think we should be able to distill it and be able to say that, okay, in this, the exercise of this jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, we think so and so and so. And then we should be able to put it in the context and, and discuss it. So I read, I read the speech by, 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 by Jasa Tikuba. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that it would have focused more on how to solve the problem. Because this is a discussion that has come up not only in Ghana, but in a lot of jurisdictions. And, and this in discussion America. as well uh, tra transcends um, time and even regimes, just as you made mention of uh, earlier. The, the two justices or nominees that, that face this, this resistance by the minority in, in this uh, parliament were Justices George Kinsley Kumsin and Justice N.S. Yaojo. Now, when it, when it came to the voting, here's what happened. His yes vote, even though there were 137 MPP, NDC MPs and an independent candidate, George Kinsley Kumsin had yes votes of 139 and no 133. And in the case of Justice N.S. Yao Zhou, yes votes of 138 and no vote 134. And, and that's how come the, the approval even went through. And I have a former member of parliament with me in, in studio, and, and I'll come to, and uh, thank you, Lord uh, Bobby Bansi, please stay with me. Now, Alaji Nusaf Hussaini, yes. you, even though you see the constitution has given these powers to the president, there are certain levels of both the demand for consultation, and then also some sort of approval by parliament. Question that Bobby Bansin asks is, let's assume that even the president chooses his cronies and persons he favors. It is incumbent on parliament, is it not, to approve or disapprove? Has parliament done the job of doing so without the partisan considerations? and also considering the competence and, and merit of all these other persons over and above the partisanship throughout the period. Uh, thank you so very much for having me. And, and let me say good morning to my co-panelists and those who are joining us on Zoom. So you're a lawyer as well, so you're wearing many hats this morning. And so, yes, your question is a very germane, relevant question. When Parliament sits to vet and approve of persons nominated by the president and submitted to parliament for the necessary procedural compliance, parliament is not acting as party representatives. No, mm -hmm. parliament is acting as a block 
to safeguard what we call the personal interest. Yes, it might play out that members of parliament might be behaving and conducting themselves that seems to suggest that they are pursuing partisan political interests. But parliament, in essence, is meeting to fulfill a very important constitutional duty, building consensus on the appointee and ensuring that that appointee has the support of the nation. Mind you, members of parliament are representatives of the constituencies, 275 constituencies. Indeed. Now, the 275 constituencies are made up of adults and minors. All adults who are registered voters in the 275 constituencies take part in determining who represents them in parliament. So we can say that the representatives in parliament is a microcosm of the, uh, the, uh, the people of Ghana. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's understand it. To, yes, the debate on, on the independence of the judiciary did not start today. And Kuruma had his own share of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and, then, and, 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 and many others. Now, even as recently as Lehman's time, Apollo had his share. Mm -hmm. All, when you read the cases, they, they were simply on the independence of the judiciary. And what, to what extent can the executive interfere in the functions of the judiciary? Is it allowable? Can we allow that? And how can that be tolerated? So clearly, yeah, all over the world, and particularly in Ghana, mm -hmm. there has been attempts to safeguard the, the independence of the judiciary. In fact, uh, the two previous speakers were at the law faculty, and if they were privileged to be taught by the professor uh, Koshiga, mm -hmm. he will raise in his jurisprudence class whether an appointment process to the judiciary, which vests in the president, necessarily makes the appointee a lackey of the president. Mm. Professor t say things that no, it doesn't. Mm. Because of the security of tenor, and in the, in the Bobby Bankson's example, because his removal can only be on proving ground. And so when a person mm. is, is appointed onto the Supreme Court, that person assumes a life of his own. That is what is expected. That's what we expect all our Supreme Court, court judges to do. So, yes, uh, Tokunu was appointed by Nana Adodanko Akufado, the president of the country. But recently, he's, she said that she will not smile at any untoward interference in the performance of her functions as a chief justice of the Supreme Court. I mean, that was speaking boldly. Mm -hmm. Also, bemoaned the lack of uh, uh, funds for the performance of the functions of the judiciary and contradicted the president in significant terms when he said, Yes, you, have, you might have made budgetary provisions for independent constitutional bodies, mm -hmm. but the budgetary uh, provisions do not necessarily translate into release of funds. True. Okay, so that was a bold statement by. So, yes. In Japan and in the lower courts in the United States, yes. to solve this problem, they say, well, put yourself up for elections. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> put mm -hmm. yourself in the lower courts. Put your, yourself up for elections and get elected so that we will we'll see what you can do. If you fail to deliver, we vote you out. So mm -hmm. in those courts, the judges derive their authority and mandate from the people. From the people. Mm -hmm. Again, there's an obvious lacuna, and it shouldn't surprise anybody that the African Peer Review Committee, and during the time of President Kufo, suggested, recommended that we cap appointments to the Supreme Court. Why? The African Peer Review Committee was not constituted by only Ghanaians, but they saw clearly the, a perceptible situation where a president who was, of, of, I mean, uh, 
ambitious could manipulate appointment to the Supreme Court and get there. And it's true that the Supreme Court is the weakest link. Yes. Because they are not voted for. They are appointed. Mm -hmm. And when they are appointed, their decisions are final. Yes. <laughs> They're final. Mm -hmm. so, so any a president who is overly ambitious might want to control that arm of government. Mm -hmm. So, and why did the, the, the African, Review, African Peer Review Committee recommend that the be a cap on the appointments to the Supreme Court? Because President Kofor had appointed 17, one, seven Supreme Court judges. Mm -hmm. 17. Why are we saying that there's a perception that the, or why is Justice Atubwa saying that there's a perception that the Supreme Court is pandering to the whims and caprices okay. of the executive. Mm -hmm. Because Nana Kufado has appointed 15. 15. You see that the, the, the facts and the evidence. Mm -hmm. It might not be that the judgments are given in favor of the president. But we all know from Atubge's remote, Atubge's research, that there, there's a propensity in the Supreme Court analyzing the cases on constitutional I mean, interpretation and other political cases that judges vote, there's a preponderance of evidence that judges vote according to the president who appointed them or the appointing authority. Now that's uh, Raymond Atubo's research. Mm -hmm. And he said he reviewed about 100 cases. And so... Yes, we clearly have a problem. I don't think that Article 46 is necessarily a problem. There are three constraints on power in the, I mean, in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. We have the substantive limitation of power. Substantive limitation on the exercise of power by any authority. And so Parliament has no power to pass retroactive legislation. Mm -hmm. There's substantive limitation. When Parliament does that, and, or if Parliament does that, that legislation or piece of legislation will be struck down as being unconstitutional because they I have see. no power. It's a limitation. There are procedural limitations. Okay? Mm -hmm. Matters affecting chieftaincy must first of all, no, that's even an institutional limitation. Mm -hmm. Procedural, a bill must be introduced in accordance with Article 106 of the Constitution. True. And it must go through. So there are procedural limitations. Now, the removal of a judge of the Superior Court of Judicature, uh, Article 146 prescribes a procedural uh, limitation. Mm -hmm. No judge can be removed if there is no evidence that the president has received a petition requesting the removal of the judge. And when the president receives such a petition, if I was a true chief justice, mm -hmm. one, to do what? To determine whether there's a prima facie case. Yes, the situations or the conditions under which these institutions work, and I, ha I have literally been a convert of Francis Fukuyama. Mm -hmm. The political order has decayed significantly because of the perception that people get onto the into state institutions, not by virtue of merit, by patrimony or, cl or clientelism. That being so, you do not expect or you will not find that these political institutions that underpin the delivery of services right. to us perform to the optimal. And when these institutions fail, by reason of the fact that they have influenced by uh, uh, chronism, they are influenced by partisan considerations, or they are influenced by ethnicity, other than merit, then the institutions are on their way to decay. Mm. It's a very, very important point. That you, and, and I bring in uh, um, sorry, Dennis Miracles Abadji because obviously he's been involved in local governance um, for, for most part of his political life. You see, the Supreme Court verdict becomes law. So it's really very important and that we make references in, when we are making some of these um, analysis. Their judgment becomes point of reference to the lower courts. So no high court or, or magistrate court can rule 
other than taking precedence from from the, the Supreme Court's own standings on specific cases. Court. Indeed. So, Dennis, if you look at the fact that this concern is not new, it transcends time, that clearly indicates the essence and importance of the judiciary because over time we've seen the Afrobiometer and others a clear indication of the dwindling confidence and trust in the legislative arm of government and the executive. So the judiciary is seen as the last straw of hope for our democracy. Now, if we're talking about alternatives to realistically prove the independence of the judiciary, what should we be looking at? Alfred, a warm good morning and good morning to Honorable Minister. As you know, yeah. and, <laughs> and all my seniors on the panel today. I have always held the view that we're overstretching this whole independence conversation. I think the last time I said it here that we should only measure independence from people's actions and not from our perception mm -hmm. and people's backgrounds. That's our problem. Because if you look at all the options and alternatives and references we can make, there is none that does not throw this issue of background into the conversation. So I don't think the background matters. I mean, take elections. When I would this reference the American system, the lower court system where they vote. Let's assume we are going to vote for Supreme Court judges in Ghana or to vote for judges in general in Ghana. What do you think will happen? If I become a lawyer or I become a judge and I want to be voted for, I will win in the Cape North. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because everybody in the Cape North will know that this judge, Dennis Miracle Sabwaji, is MPP. And we in the Cape North, we are predominantly MPP. Honorable Nisa Fuseni win in whole central. Mm -hmm. And so you'd realize that ultimately, we are so going to. I'm, I'm just using. Yes. I didn't want, yes. yes, want to use his own. Yes, I didn't want to use his own constituency. <laughs> okay. So yeah. you'd realize that ultimately, mm. we'll come back to the same point, because election of the judges will not take away the background of the individuals. Mm -hmm. So it brings the conversation back to the point I made, and that is why today hands up completely for lawyer Bobby Banson. I share completely in his views and his position on the matter. I think that we are overstretching the conversation. So long as these judges are going to adjudicate and they are going to give verdicts, people are going to win cases and others will lose. And when others lose, they would raise concerns. The concerns could be legitimate, others could be technical, others could be factual, others would also have impugning your background. So I don't see any way out of this, except for us to say, don't let us generalize the whole thing and make it look like it is a 90% rot. I think it's a 10% and a 90% positive. Because today there are several cases in the judicial service from the lower court to the Supreme Court that are being adjudicated and nobody is complaining about. Why do we political class want to impose our 5 or 10 percent cases on the whole system that is being operated? And then we say it and then we don't give, we say, okay, um, they should take the president out. When we take the president out, who are those who are going to appoint? We should give it to a certain body. Okay, let's bring GPR to you. Let's bring this. Let, do you know where the GPR to you nominee is coming from? And then ultimately, when I was listening to Prof, I heard him. For example, when he got to the traditional council, he said, is quite independent. Because even in the traditional council, the traditional council rep or the House of Chiefs rep, we will dig into his background. We will. So there is no way out except to stick to the facts. Did the ruling go in my favor? Yes. Was it against me? Yes. Do I feel that the judgment was fair or not? It wasn't fair. Is it because this person is Miracle's brother? That is why he ruled against me. What is my basis? Let's have a conversation on that. People have been sentenced to death. And afterwards, it was realized that they were innocent. That is just the system that the human beings we've taken for ourselves. People have been sentenced to 30 years imprisonment in the U.S. and other places. And after 30 years, they've had to be released. 
and compensated. It is the facts you present at court that determines the verdict for you. I don't think it's because the Attorney General, under this dispensation, has lost separate, several cases to the Supreme Court, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. Hasn't he? The same Supreme Court has ruled severally against him. Who are the proponents of this whole idea that, oh, it's all independence? Lawyer Justice Atuguba himself, in 1992. He stood as a candidate for the MPP before the MPP pulled out. Two years down the line, he declared openly in China Paga that he's no longer MPP and switched to the NDC. Then in 1995, he was appointed to the Supreme Court. He's the longest serving Supreme Court judge we can, we can recall in recent days. But he was appointed by President Rawlings in 1995 as an NDC member, Khaled. Is it the case that when he ruled against the MPP in 2013, it was because he was NDC? I don't think so. It was based on the facts at play. So I think that we are really overstretching it. I am telling you that no matter the alternative or the option that we use, Alfred, no matter, let us, let's throw all the options. I would always find evidence of people coming up with background. Professor Enchi, he knows it. He is described this morning as a governance expert, but he's a politician. He contested on an NDC ticket, but he's a very fine brain, listening to all the things he's saying, very fantastic ideas. Does it mean that if he qualifies to be a lawyer, qualifies to become a judge, he cannot be a Supreme Court judge because he ran as a candidate for the NDC in New York North? Is that what we are saying? And that when I go before him in his court and I have evidence and facts, because I am MPP, he will throw away my evidence and facts and rule against me? I think that we are just overly stretching the conversation. Yeah, and that's where justice must not only be done, it must be manifestly seen to be done. I don't think there's any problem with our system. I doubt. <laughs> because I think the problem with the system is that the problem with the system is that we impugn people's credibility based on where we stand. That is all. Because it's not the same Supreme Court that has given several verdicts for and against the NDC and the MPP. Sometimes the NDC will go to court. When they win, you hear them praising the judiciary. Sometimes they go, they lose, you hear them attacking the judiciary. I think that it is just the political class that has hijacked this conversation. Have you thought about the guys in the magistrate court and the circuit court? I said it here the last time. I stand in my office as an MC in the Capim North, and I see my circuit court. And I see people come there and being thrown into jail for stealing of goods and and fouls and what have you, sometimes even without proper uh, representation. Those are the reforms we should be talking about. That how do we ensure that, because when we talk about judiciary, it's not just the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, Alfred, is not only educating on NDC MPP cases, and I insist that I want to challenge everybody to give me the alternatives. None of the alternatives will come without somebody being colored or tainted. Each of them would come with somebody. Okay, so you bring chiefs across Ghana. They are the only ones who are becoming chiefs based on their, you know, inheritance to be nominating judges. They are go likely going to nominate Professor Entry. But I will come and say, ah, but this prof, he contested for NDC in 2023 parliamentary elections in New Jersey. Not. Meanwhile, prof qualifies. And then we'll go and nominate um, uh, Alfred. I say, oh, but Alfred is a brother to Dennis Mirako Sabuaje. Alfred and Dennis Mirako Sabuaje are direct brothers. Dennis Mirako Sabuaje is MPP, so Alfred is MPP. Let's look at the election option. There are two forms of elections. One that we do through parliament, and that's what we do at the moment. Like you rightly said, the current judges, when they disagreed, they voted on them. And like Honorable Inisa said, that is the view of the people. They are representing the views of the people. And so they voted 139, 134. What is the rule? The rule says that majority carries the day. And in our dispensation, once the majority has voted, it is assumed that that's what the people want. Let's talk about general election. Ashanti region, Eastern region judges will be MPP. Voter region judges will be NDC. And so we'll come back to square one. We are overstretching the conversation. Those who are proposing and making this comment are only saying it from parochial uh, 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 perspective because Justice Atuguba himself, who is recommending this, is a beneficiary of the same system and he himself was colored. Why is it that his entire long service as a Supreme Court judge 
the longest serving Supreme Court judge, all this war, he never, for once, never, for once, raised this concern that, as you rightly said, mm -hmm. Anabu Yunisa said, has been there from Nkrumah's time. He was okay. on the bench. He was seated there. Why didn't he ever say that, oh, no, you know, guys, I was appointed by President Rawlings, and I was in D.C. because it was public. And so I think that I am colored, and I disagree with this approach. So please, I want to go out. Let's change the system. At some point, he was an acting chief justice. Why didn't he change it? Look at this process. The Judicial Council will make some recommendations. Okay. Give it to the president. Right. I wrap up. Give it to the president. The president looks at it, at it. So they can present maybe 10 or 15 to the president. And the president will select two. And the president will present the two to parliament. Parliament will vet them. When parliament is satisfied, they either unanimously pass them or they vote on them. Somebody should give me a superior alternative to this. That See, would not have issues with it. Yeah, and what we talk about, the alternatives, I, I'll, I'll come back. Because this has to at least be considered in terms of addressing this age-old question that keeps coming up every now and then. And clearly indicates that there's a problem somewhere. Let me go on, on Zoom. Thankfully, we've been joined by Professor Stephen Kweku Azari. He is a professor of law, a lecturer and a Democracy and Development Fellow in Public Law and Justice at the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD. And um, a number of instances I had to speak to this matter. Professor Kwaza, it's good to have you. Thank you. Good morning to you. Hello, Prof. Good morning. I think he's muted. Hello. If, 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 if you can unmute for me, please. Yes. Hello? Yes, Prof. Yes, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I can say thanks for having me and good morning to your other panelists. Let me quickly put it on record that I'm a professor of accounting, mm -hmm. uh, not a professor of law. And so I come to this conversation with a perspective that is different from uh, some of the other lawyers in that I straddle multiple areas. I, <laughs> know a little bit about law, but I also know a little bit about accounting and I know a little bit about real life. So, so that's the perspective and background that I'm going to uh, come, come, come with. Let's bring the real life perspective to what we're talking about uh, this morning. <laughs> and, and you raise fundamental questions about the interpretation of Article 144 and the judges failing to abide by their oath. Where yeah. is the failure in the judges yeah, abiding think... by their oath there? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's the biggest problem because uh, the appointment mechanism is interesting. And as I indicated, if you read the Constitution clearly, uh, the president doesn't appoint. I mean, the Constitution says appoint, but that term is a term of art. You have to read the whole Constitution carefully to understand what the appointment itself is describing. Uh, there are different levels of appointment. In some cases, the president nominates in consultation with another body, and that nomination is subject to approval by parliament. So it's a co-appointment process. In some other cases, the president is just doing a ministerial function. He nominates, but that nomination is ministerial in that there is an advisory body. And the advice there is a very funny word because it's not the advice that we use in ordinary parlance. It is an advice that comes from English common law. So if you look at the Commonwealth constitutions, you would always say the queen, the head of state, appoints based on the advice of the prime minister. So if you go to the 1957 constitution, where all this starts, there's this thing that says the governor general, the governor general then represented the queen, appoints ministers based on the advice of the prime minister. The prime minister then was Kwame Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. The governor general then was some nominee of the uh, queen or king of England. But nobody seriously thought that the phraseology meant somebody in England was appointing ministers for Ghana. And if you go around the Commonwealth countries, you would see all this type of language. So the, the advice there 
is binding. And there's a case which Martin refers to where I think uh, Justice Atuguba correctly discusses this issue, but I believe his approach and then the other judges were totally, Justice Doche was totally off the, the rank, saying the advice there is the, the, the ordinary meaning of advice. I think Justice Atuguba had it right, but even his uh, uh, contention was a little wishy-washy. So it has not been made clear that advice there is binding. And this also applies to the Electoral Commission. Those who framed the Constitution were not so uh, unaware of what was going on, mm -hmm. that they thought the president should appoint members of the Electoral Commission to come and referee a game that the president participates in. No, they said the president appoints, but acting on the advice, acting on the advice means the advice is binding. The Council of State is really the appointer, and the president appoints as a head of state, as a head of state, he has a seal, and that seal goes under the appointment. But the substantive appointment, the substantive appointment is done by a council of state. And so there's an interpretation problem with the way we go about reading our constitution. I see. Quite apart from the interpretation problem, I agree that, look, uh, Dennis was making a point. It doesn't matter how you appoint someone, unless that person itself is honest, honest yeah. then there's going to be problems. Mm -hmm. Yes. Look, if you look at our constitution, yes. That's the point. judges enjoy the best package in terms of retirement. Mm -hmm. They retire on their salary. They, uh, their, their salary cannot be varied to their disadvantage. They have life tenure subject to good conduct. So we've created all these goodies for them because we want them to be independent. And before they take the bench, they take an oath. Look, mm -hmm. if you take an oath, the oath says you are going to do justice by all manner of people, regardless of who appointed you and how you were appointed. So later on, if you are not doing those things that your oath compels you to do, then we must stop talking about appointment and figure out ways of removing them for failing to abide by their oath. We don't name and shame judges. So for instance, we can come here and say judges have done this, judges have done that. But nobody ever says this judge did this or said that, and this is ridiculous. If you come, if you go to other uh, jurisdictions, they have law reviews, and these law reviews hold judges accountable. If you write an opinion that has no basis in law, mm -hmm. the number of articles that will be written condemning you, you and your future. Uh, generation will regret for that decision mm -hmm. there is a judicial hall of shame yeah. and in this judicial hall of shame justices who have written opinions that have turned out to be horrible are sent there or are, 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 are nominated to that judicial hall of shame we don't do the same thing if you wanted to do the same thing in ghana people will say oh judges you shouldn't talk about judges and so on and so forth so the issue is an absence of accountability because you appoint and you want people to be independent, but the other side of the independence point is accountability. If they are not independent, how do you hold them accountable? And you know, in terms of independence, there are different types of independence. There's institutional independence. We don't have a problem with institutional independence, mm -hmm. at least not to a large scale, because we've done all the things, we've guaranteed the tenure and so on. And then if it goes to the lower courts, we have an appellate process. So if somebody gets it wrong, it's subject to appeal. The reason we keep talking about the Supreme Court is because their judgments are not subject to appeal or review or because the review is uh, not a matter of rights. Mm -hmm. And then because they handle issues arising from the Constitution and issues arising from the Constitution basically touch on governance. So obviously there will be a light shone on the Supreme Court. And I think in recent cases, but if I say recent, I use that advisedly because look, I, I, I've written an article in 2006. And in 2006, I raised all the issues that Justice Satuguba was raising. So these are not new issues that Justice Satuguba, uh, uh, Justice Satuguba is not raising any new issues. True. He's just confirming things that we know 
And the biggest thing that came out from his article is the notion of empanelment, because we've talked about that, and we've always said that could be a source of a big problem where the chief justice handpicks the justices that should sit on a particular case. And in the case of just that took over, he gives a specific example of a situation where he was frozen from taking part in cases for six months because he had given a decision that went contrary to what the chief justice was. That can never happen. So mm. that is something that parliament can immediately take on and amend the constitution to somehow, number one, cap the number of justices that we can have, and number two, make it clear that if there is a constitutional case, then all justices should be allowed to sit on sit the on, on constitutional that case. case. And then I would add that there should be another practice direction which encourages anyone who wants to file an amicus brief to do so when it's a constitutional case. Because when you have a constitutional case, the parties are really nominal uh, plaintiffs. I've gone to the court many times with Supreme Court and uh, with uh, constitutional cases. Right. But those cases do not affect me directly. So mm. I'm a nominal plaintiff. And other people who have an interest, everybody has an interest in the constitution, should be allowed to also file a brief so that the Supreme Court is sufficiently and comprehensively briefed by all affected parties. They have evidence from all interested parties, and then they can take all those ideas into account in arriving at a decision. Okay, so, so in, in this is that the takeaway is that the, the empaneling power or function of the chief justice should be one of worry. It should be taken away immediately if we are talking about addressing some of these concerns regarding the, the Supreme Court's own functions, is it not? Yes, absolutely. And, 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 and I've raised this, others have raised this since 1993. But this is the first time someone is coming from the court to confirm that these things that we talk about are not theoretical, they are practical, they are actually happening. And so we can no longer sit down and let this problem fester. We must address the problem immediately. If the only hope that we have in, in addressing these concerns that have been raised by not just Justice Atuguba, but you and many others, is the ho hoping that the justices or the judges would abide by their oath. If they fail to do so, what are the alternatives? What should be the measures to, to address judges who fail to do so if there's no problem with how they are appointed, as you are talking about? Well, you see, when you say you have violated your oath, it's not, it's not something small. If you violate your oath, you should be removed. Removal or impeachment processes should be initiated and you'll be removed from the court. We must take oaths seriously. It is more important than anything. When you are given that Bible and you swear on it, it is a serious undertaking. That, that is why presidents, for instance, and Supreme Court justice, so they swear the oath of allegiance. But, but are the oaths swearing taken seriously in this country, from what you see? They are not enforced. That's what I'm saying. We have a problem. We have an accountability problem, not an appointment problem. Because no matter who you appoint, if people are dishonest, they are going to be dishonest. So then what you need to put in place is accountability mechanisms. When people do not follow their oaths, or when people violate their oaths, or when people make judgments that are so ridiculous that everyone can say this is misconduct, then we must have affirmative steps to remove them, to punish them, to shame them, to embarrass them. If you don't have that, then, 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 then we are going to forever be talking and we are going to be forever amending constitutions and nothing will be achieved by these amendments because ultimately you are going to have to put people there and the integrity of the people is what matters. So but talking about integrity, integrity is not something that you just get when you go to the court. Mm. Integrity is something that you have to build over the years. So the way we teach people in the primary schools, in the uh, uh, secondary schools, the universities, the legal education, very important. Ethics must be a part of legal education. 
Our legal education is also very weak. We don't want to talk about that because, you know, people's feelings get hurt when you talk about that. But our legal education is weak. Unlike many right. countries, unlike many countries, we treat law like a vocation. And so you go to the universities for a few years and they say go to some general school of law and learn some how to write, a, what do you call it, a, a writ. And then you go and look at the Ghana School of Law exam, and then they ask you, uh, you memorize how to write a writ, and then the question is, write a writ. How can someone be trained to do law this way? Legal education should be sent to the universities. The universities have a comparative advantage in doing research, in developing clinics, in doing all these things. Mm. So they can design an education system that trains the 21st century lawyer. If we don't understand this problem, we'll fall behind South Africa and Kenya. Because look, go to Kenya's website and look right. at their Supreme Court cases. You see a vast difference between their mm -hmm. cases and our cases, unrelated to who appoints them and anything. It's part of the education system. The mm -hmm. education that we have will produce right. the people who go to the bar and the people who go to the bench. If you get the education system wrong, you are going to see its effect on the bench and you are going to see its effect on, on the bar. Indeed. And it's not a palatable conversation, but we must have it. We must have it, indeed. And that's exactly why we are having it this morning. Professor Kweku Azar, I thank you very much for uh, calling in your intervention into this matter and the proposal for a judicial hall of shame to do with some of these things. And I, I thank you. Really appreciate your recommendations on this and, and, and also thank your you, thoughts. Uh, Alfred, and again, hi yeah. to my friends, Matt. He's a fellow of Democracy and Development at the Center for Democratic Development, a professor of accounting, and then also a lecturer of law. We'll be back shortly after this quick break here on Key Point. There's another very important weighty matter we would get into. And that is where the aftermath of the floods and matters are rising. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Your favorite Abna Rice is saying thank you to all its loyal customers and consumers for being loyal to the brand. From the 1st of September 2023 to 31st of January 2024, buy any 4.5 kg bag of Abna Rice and you stand the chance of finding a gift voucher inside the bag. Prices you stand to find include LED TVs, washing machines, microwaves, blenders, smartphones, bags of rice, banners, and many more. Redeem your gift voucher from any Lele Depot or selected wholesalers nationwide. So, what are you waiting for? Go on and grab your 4.5 kg bag of Abna rice and win big. Remember, the Abna Achedia promo is on from the 1st of September 2023 and ends on 31st of January 2024. It's the Abna Achedia promo. Buy more, win more. Terms and conditions apply. This advert is FDA approved. Are you ready? The biggest bonus ever! Promotion with cool prices and many other bonus offers. Support 24 7. One expects gives you more. Use promo code to get your biggest bonus. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Get responsibly, not for persons below 18 years. Gambling can be addictive. Rasta. Rasta, Rasta. What does Rasta really mean to the people? In today's episode of Rasta by Vision, this is what we're looking at. Rasta. What does it mean to you? To me, Rasta means real. Rasta to me means artistic. Rasta to me means sport. Rasta to me means trailblazing. That's what people like you and I do every day. What? But where are you there? I did. Yes. You do, you do. Listen, Rasta, I have a bone to pick with you. Some of the things that you say on air, though, are morally, ethically, and politically. Yo, bo, bo. Kids are watching. Yo, wala, zila. A mini bombo. Ah. Sit on my own. Respect. Rasta means the motherland, Africa. Real artistic. Spirit.
sporty trail blazing African choco malt drink. This outfit is FDA approved. This is the new season of your number one cooking show, McBrow's Kitchen. Watch us on TV3. 5 to 6 p.m. Every Saturday. McBrow's Kitchen. Enjoy the day. Brown's Kitchen. Enjoy the McBrown's Kitchen shows this and every Saturday at 5 p.m. on TV3. My name is Um Kalsun Zakaria Adam, a public health practitioner and an OMFS resident. We all know that when October rolls around, it's all about breast cancer awareness. Breast cancer is very, very deadly and we need to educate people to come to the hospital and not keep them at our churches or at our mosques. People should be able to get out of the fear, especially when you go to the hospital and it's detected. What is the term for spread of breast cancer? Multiplication. <laughs> Subtraction. <laughs> when you are obese, it also affects the health of your breast. Yes, and so you actually have higher chances yes. of developing breast cancer. <laughs> The Ladies Circle shows this Saturday at 6 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Yaz Sanitary Pad. Onga. Circle. MTN. Woodin. Nivia. For your shade of beautiful. Get ready for the thrill of a lifetime. A call was made and many responded to it. The journey to finding the ultimate top in 10 has officially begun with some of the sharpest and brightest brains in this country ready to surmount different hurdles. You are very, very courageous. That's what Janet was talking about right yes. from the beginning. Donc t'as pas d'enfant. Je n'en ai pas. À 37 ans. Oui. They will face grueling tasks, fierce competition and high stake challenges. Who excels and who exits? 12 participants, 10 intense weeks, and one ultimate winner. The search for the ultimate top intern coming soon on your screens. The top intern, today's learners, tomorrow's leaders. Welcome back to Key Point. We're live on 3FM 92.7. Gentlemen, yes, please. Also on uh, TV3 Ghana on Facebook, the DSCV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. My guests are with me in studio and also uh, on Zoom. Now, Professor Stephen Adair, former Rector of the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, former Chair of the GRA Board, and also of the National Development Planning Commission, uh, made some worrying um, observations and in fact a comment not in oblivion because uh, what we understand is that you know, Yoko is going to be writing to him he has enough references to back some of the issues that he has talked about this is the exact statement that got to the economic and organized crime office invited to look into the said uh, accession take a look we'll be giving to you Provided you put one million up front, though, not that when you get your money. Then, and this is what a Kufuado must be thinking about, and if he knows about it, must be ashamed of that. Now, his people demand from you a certain amount before you be considered for the job. Why? Because then when you, they get it, whether you, the government pays you or not, they have gotten their money. As if people are in a hurry to loot the country before the end of Akufuadu's term. One of the greatest disappointment of uh, Nane Akufuadu's regime is that, honestly, he raised the hope of Ghanaians. Ghanaians expected that we had gotten the leader with a vision, with the charisma, with the determination. And it seems if he doesn't redeem himself in the next 14 months, he will go down history of the, one of the most disappointing leaders. And what the co corruption, the 
arrogance they think that there is Ghana is for them and that you know without them Ghana would not be there even think some of them thinking that they should tell us who should be our next president God forbid the nurses and the teachers who constituted about 75 percent of public service would go for loans and because they were public servants it was assured now they are run away and they can't pay so I have to chase them to London, to America, and that thing. So the small banks, I know one which has about 7 million Ghana cities they are chasing, they have to write off. He anticipated that citizens will hold leaders accountable to promote growth and development. That's Professor Kwekwasari there. Now, after this statement, the ministry... Uh, well, Professor Stephen Adai, I beg your pardon, Professor Stephen Adai. The, after this statement, the Ministry of Roads and Highways issued a statement indicating uh, the decision to have the Economic and Organized Crime Office, Yoko, invited to look into this. Now, this is uh, the statement that was issued by the Ministry of Roads and Highways on the invitation to the Economic and Organized Crime Office, Yoko. The specific intent of the invitation was for the Economic and Organized Crime Office to investigate the statement by Professor Stephen Adair to establish the veracity or otherwise of it and also what the way forward should be. Now, question is, we have spoken to some of the contractors and then also these associations who m made reference to the fact that sometimes monies are demanded of them, but not to the tune of one million. So that is the figure that they have issues with. But take a look at this. This is the exact intent of this statement. It says from the Minister of Roads and Highways, the attention of the Minister of Roads and Highways has been drawn to a video clip in circulation in, in the social media space in which Professor Stephen Adair continues, makes some allegations of corruption in the public sector concerning the award of road contracts. The allegation was made by Professor Stephen Adair on TV3, private television station, as you are watching us now. It continues, in the said interview first aired on Friday, 28 October 2023, Professor Adair alleges that he has information to the effect that persons seeking road contracts are told Road contracts will be given to you provided you pay one million. Goes on and on. These allegations are surprising at the least because the processes leading to the award of road contracts are open, transparent, competitive, and in accordance with the law. And so based on that, they are inviting the Economic and Organized Crime Office to look into the details of it. it says given that the alleged conduct borders on the commission of crime against the republic the minister of roads and highways honorable kwesi amwakwata has as at the date of issue the 23rd of october 2023 requested the executive director of the economic and organized crime office to fully investigate the said allegations. It goes on, the ministry wishes to assure, um, it says, the public that it shall cooperate fully and support Yoko in the conduct of its work. So that is the statement that came through from the ministry on this matter. Let me start off with, with you, uh, Professor Enoch Enchi. And I'll come to Inosa Fuseni because of his experience and work in this area. Professor Nokentri, when you first heard this, and especially because you have been on a, in a conversation that some road contractors themselves mm -hmm. have indicated that some demands are made of, of them to pay certain monies, which are not official, but they also want the contract. So they make the payments. Beyond the Yoko's invitation, what should be the concern of the, the ministry to ensure that we have at least an internal investigation into this matter so that 
these contractors who are also making these comments can also come in to help beyond what Professor Sivnadeya said? Well, thank you very much. I think fear is the path to the dark side, and that is what we are having, the situation we are having here. We have a former minister of roads here sitting among us today, so uh, when it's his turn, you talk about that. But any time I'm in Ghana, I ask myself, do we have a minister of roads? Why? That's the question I always ask. Our roads are terrible. Our roads are so terrible that I cannot imagine, because I have some white friends coming from uh, Netherlands recently, and they asked me that mechanics should be making a lot of money here because all roads are bad. Now, those we go to borrow money from, from US and UK, they have what they call scheduled maintenance of the roads. Any little pothole, they are filling it that night. Because they don't want to waste money, but we waste, we waste, we waste money. We wait till all the roads are broken down, and then we go beg him for loan to come and fix this road. Even common bridge stress tests, we don't do them in Ghana. So mo most of these bridges, you know, are almost collapsing, and nobody do stress tests to see, unless there's an accident. And why we are not proactive about our roads, I don't know. 50 years ago, Nkrumah built this Tamamoto Way, just 12 kilometers, 8 miles. Look at the potholes in it. So I've been asking myself that, do we have a minister in charge of roads? Our roads are terrible. And we are always going to the mechanics to fix our cars. So why don't you fix it? Now, Ghanaians have something syndrome that we call the Omo Pasem Surasem. I've had situations, what does Ali Professor there talk about? Individuals coming to me and say, Prof, I have to pay this amount of money to get a job. I have to pay this to get this contract. But don't go and mention my name because where we sit, if my name is mentioned, I'm not going to get a contract. I'm not going to get help from the government, so don't mention my name. We've had even ministers and MPs who will tell you something. They say that where, where I sit, I can't talk about it. So why are we living in, in fear? Is that our standard? And most of the time I ask myself, because in America, even a farm road, my mother came to visit me for two years. She went to farm roads where we go get goats and all that. She said, so individual roads are like this. And it's because the person is a citizen paying taxes. Even common street lights, it's a problem. Yesterday, I passed through most places in Accra. And I must recommend the police. Everywhere you see barriers. That is good for our security. But now we have a lot of intermittent light-offs. And when you go, street lights are not there. So that increases crime. We need to do a lot of serious introspective here in the way we see things. So coming back to the same contractors mm -hmm. who went and told Pro, because he's a professor. You know, some of us, the situation we find ourselves, you cannot be a professor and a dean and a rector of an institution with any political appointment or anything. Sometimes it is your academic powers that sends you there. So he knows that he has to cite the source. You know, but individuals will come and tell you and just ask them, give me, you know, the evidence. They will tell you that I can't give it to you. So he's now a lone piper in this situation, even though he's fighting the common cause. So my advice to these contractors is that if you help Professor Adair by bringing the, you know, the evidences, it is going to help our dispensation. Why? Because in the future, you are no more going to pay even the little bribes that you are saying, because look at our roads. Sometimes they do it within six months, the roads are just fluffy. Mm -hmm. And then we, we, it's, it's scrapped off. And they will all tell you off camera that they have been paying bribes to get it. So once they pay the money 10%, once they get the contract, the money left to execute the road is so small that they can't do it. Mm -hmm. So we have an engineering problem. The same situation we have at Akusombo. Engineering is such that we knew there was going to be a spill and somebody was afraid to talk about it. Because that is how the trend of engineering. We also have trend in leadership. We have trends in governance. Now the trend is that our roads contractors should give us the evidences, you know, even off camera, so that in future they will no more pay bribes to mm -hmm. get contracts. Now that they are saying they are paying some money, but it's not up to one million, what is the amount? Bring evidences. But you know, this all borders on corruption. And when we talk about corruption, corruption is something illegal in our laws, our constitution. So people will not come publicly and say that I pay bribe for this. And, but we know that is a norm that is happening. It is not helping us. We are not getting better roads. We are not getting good leadership. We are not getting accountability. So I am urging the contractors to help us with the evidence. Prof also knows that he has to provide the evidence. But it's difficult because I've even seen people who have been violently abused. And I've asked them to report to the police and they will tell me that, well, the person will kill me. So being afraid that the person who has abused you 
It's also threatening you not to go and report. So what kind of system have we built for ourselves that we cannot even be bold and speak power to authority? So I think that, you know, we need to make sure that our roads mm -hmm. are in good shape. Nobody is paying bribe to get a contract. I, I once did a, you know, uh, consulting for an organization, and you know, the, the leader who hired me to fix the problem, I realized that the leader was the problem. And, the leader and was the problem. The leader was the problem of that organization, even though the leader hired me as a consultant to look into the issue and come out with a solution. And when I told the leader, point blank, that you were the source, the leader was shocked that, no, it cannot be me. Of course, that's, it can't be you because she was in a denier. Now, I am praying that when this comes out, we will know that was the minister aware? Because there's a power in the word if. And I remember uh, Professor Adair says that if the president is aware, if the president is aware, then share unto him. That's what he said. But if the president is not aware, is the minister aware? But the okay. minister said that because it borders on public, whatever, uh, he's asking Yoko to investigate. Mm -hmm. Some people have asked for a commission of inquiry. I don't know how that is going to end. Because the same contractors that we are talking about, if you call them and ask them to provide evidence, they can't. Who gives you receipt for paying bribe to get a contract? So it's a very difficult area, but I think that that orientation in our system where everything that contracts are given, people are paying 10%, we should find a way to scrap it because corruption does not affect only the corrupt person. It affects the whole society. Well, Professor Enokechi, thank you for this and the perspective that you bring there. And, 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 and Dennis, you see, the reference is made to the minister himself at a point stating that he is aware that there's corruption happening in his ministry and we have that video we'll play it in a bit and and that if, even though he tries to deal with it when he sucks those people the people who come in the new people who come in become much more corrupt than the people that he sucked so it's become a systemic problem so making this professor Stephen Adair's ref, uh, statement as a reference point the angle that Professor Sinok Entry brings in that there must be a holistic approach to addressing this so that Professor Stephen Adair is only giving us an indication of what we all know might be happening. He has come out to speak about it. What should be done internally by the ministry itself to complement the work that they have asked the Yoko to do? You know, Alfred, one of the things I realize we do in this country yeah, is that it looks like 90% of the population is political. And so once an issue comes, we pick an aspect of the issue and run with it. And for some reason, nobody even bothers to go into the detail. And then that narration runs for weeks. When, if I listen to what you just said, the impression has just been created <laughs> as if the rules minister is admitting that there is corruption, which corroborates the point Professor Day is making, which is, which is you know, fair. But Professor Day was not, and he never referred to people inside the road ministry. He said politicians. He said Nanado's appointees. So don't even bring that matter. He made a specific allegation, which must be proven. We shouldn't confuse the people. The roads minister has been on record for several times, raising concerns with how technical people and even do their work. You know, he, sometimes he complains about, and that's his job. That is the effort he is putting in place to ensure that the sector gets what, you know, uh, needs to be done, done. But that is not the case Professor Day is making. He is making a false allegation, which he cannot prove. You say it's a false allegation. Of course. Because, you see, because, you see, when it comes to road construction, and you say the politicians are taking money, the politicians are taking money, and he didn't say just money, he said one million about a million Ghana cities before the, the project is awarded and all of that. The most effective, efficient, and fair way to establish this is not what you think or what you claim somebody has told you. Honorable Nisa Fuseni has been accused of taking money before awarding contract when he was at the roads ministry. Is it true? I'm just making a point. Is it true? So I just say it on air, and then I go home. Then Honorable Nisa Fuseni now has the responsibility to come and prove that he never took money. What kind of country are we running? Why are we doing this to ourselves? 
Why? Why are we allowing politics and our hate for other political parties, whatever it is, to destroy ourselves? Are you aware of the complexities involved in road projects in this country? And I'm sure Nabu Fuseni will get into that. Are you aware that some of the roads you see are not necessarily awarded by even the, the, the road ministry? And are you aware of the technicalities involved in the procurement? The people who set to open the tender? The people who say, in fact, let's start it from the design. Those who design, those who develop the bills of quantities, before you go into tender opening, are you aware that the minister himself doesn't even sit on the tender committee that sits to award the contract? So if we want to fix a problem and we decide to jump ahead of the problem, and, and Alfred, I want you to really give me, if you have to give me all my time that I would need today to deal with this Thomas. matter. If we have to solve a problem and we decide that we have to jump ahead of the problem with emotions and sentiments because of our dislike for somebody or something, then we muddy the waters and the issues are never resolved. He's here. He can tell you whether in his ministry, when he was minister, he was taking money to award contracts. Because in that ministry, the politicians that Professor Day will refer to are only two or three, depending on the number of ministers that are there. Maybe the minister and the deputies. Outside them, the rest are all technical people. Some of them are not with Mr. Fuseni met at the ministry, and they are still there. So if you have a, an allegation that you cannot prove, and like Professor Entry said, and you are a professor, you don't say it. You don't. To the extent that you say it and continue to say that the president should be ashamed when you know that you do not have proof, or when you know that whoever came to tell you will not be willing to step forward to testify. You don't say it. That is the truth, though. Because, you see, you are impugning people's credibility. You are putting people's integrity on the line, which may or may not be true. And if you open yourself up this way, then you are asking everybody to ignore the professor that you are and deal with the matter as it is. When you were made board chairman of Ghana Revenue Authority, and procurement were ongoing. Were you taking bribes? Because you have been an Aneku Fadu appointee. So when you say that Aneku Fadu appointees are taking bribes, you are part. You are part. You have been Aneku Fadu appointees in several institutions. So when you say that the Kufadu appointees are taking bribes, you are part. You cannot take yourself out because you didn't get the appointment this time around. That's why you are speaking. You think that's why you are saying no, that? I don't know. I'm just asking questions. Because as it stands now, I am very glad that the highway ministry, I am very glad that the highway ministry has sent the matter to Yoko. Because bribery is not just like saying that I won't vote for MPP, I won't vote for NDC. If you do not have evidence of bribery, you don't say it. Especially when you are making a specific allegation. If you say it against me, I will take you on. And you know what we do in Ghana? When I accuse Honorable Inisa Fuseni of bribery, and Honorable Inisa Fuseni decides to fight back. Then everybody turns against him. He who has been accused and is saying that proof, they say, which proof? And it's happening not only with Professor Adair's situation. Look at this um, gentleman. What's his name? The gentleman, this, this guy that's made protest a career now. Oh. Occupy oh, something. What, something. What, if you are not. No, no, but I, don't, I don't remember. Yeah, he's made protest his career now. Every day soliciting for France to protest. What's his name? Forgotten. So, so, so he, exactly. he, he, he stands, stands in front of a camera and accuses the national security minister that the national security minister Oliver. attempted to bribe him with a specific amount of money. And then he goes on to say that I have an audio of that meeting. And then he goes away. He walks away. And then the media leaves him and then he comes to call the one that has been accused to come and prove that he didn't attempt to give today. You go and sit on Twitter and say, I was at court to receive my rate. They should bring it to me. Why are you waiting for court? For, why are you waiting for the gentleman to sue you before you bring the audio that you said on tape that you have it? You are a liar. Point exactly. So straight away, the point is that we are allowing too many of such baseless false allegations to fly. And we spend our mornings, which should be used to be discussing health, should be used to be discussing education, discussing people's sentiments, which are completely false. 
Because here you are, and I'm giving you, please, I'm giving you examples. Mm -hmm. Here you are, Why you, you here you are, point. this gentleman who made this false allegation that he has an audio, you were able to boldly say that you have an audio. Now, you want to be sent to court before you bring the audio. Bring it out. The same applies to Prof. Ade. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any need for any investigation by anybody. Iyoko is the best independent institution mm -hmm. you can expect to undertake such investigation. Professor Ade should make himself available. Go to Yoko. Go and submit every because we need it. We need to solve the problems. He's a senior statesman. I can see that he's worried. He means well for Ghana. He, he thinks that Ghana should prosper. And so he should put it out. But if he's unable to, then he should come back and come and apologize for peddling falsehood and sentiment. As I conclude, I think Professor Entry in this part is very important. Professor Entry, when he started his conversation, decided to quickly wear his um his political cap. Come on. What, what yes, exactly? Yes, yes. yes. I mean, exactly I mean, if Professor Entry, you, you are tied a road minister. He are tied a road minister. That no, if I you no, oh, what does he say? Can I can I finish? Yes, there is. You know there is a minister. If you ask that question, what does it mean? You know there is a road minister. Person? Yes, I am. No, 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 no. I speak no, for no, government. No, no, no. So, let me, so let me establish a point. So let me establish a point. He's a politician. He has... Uh, did you contest an election? But I asked about the... the I, would I, what, 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 yes, okay. I did contest an election, but what, I talked about an issue. How have I attacked you? How? No, you said what I said. Yes, I said that you have won your political account. Why is that an attack? So, so are you a politician? That politics speak through me. Are you a politician? I am. So what are you saying? But the authorities so, 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 me. So, so, no, no, stop doing that. Uh, no, so tell me the attack. You did the same to Alan Shabbat. Tell me the attack. Tell me the attack. Why is that? You are a young Dennis. man. So, you, you, you shouldn't do that. Are you a politician? Dennis, that has issue? nothing to do with what I it has, said. It has. My integrity. It has. And what I so, said. How did I impugn your integrity? How did I impugn your integrity? Okay, make your point. How did I? Make your point. So the point is that I haven't impugned anybody's integrity. I am saying that you wore your political cap, the NDC political cap, when you started your statement by saying that it's as if there is no roads minister in Ghana. I said it's false. And then you okay. go and say that everywhere you pass, mm -hmm. the roads are bad. These are the facts. Number one, the road minister you claim is not there. This is what he inherited. He inherited a total network road size of 78,402. 8, Today, you claim every road is bad. That road minister has moved it from 78,402 to 98,203 kilometers. That road minister you claim is non-existent. In terms of road classes are there. Mm. Now, the road mix that he met, and Alfred, I have to finish this one. No, it's an important, I've, I've it's an important time, point. Uh, you are rounding up. When I'm done, you can decide not to give me any more time, but let me mm -hmm. speak. <laughs> road condition mix. You claim that, why is the road minister? The road minister inherited from your government a total of 39% good roads. He's moved it to 44%. Fact. The road minister inherited from your government a total of 32% fair roads. He's moved it to 34%. Fact. The road minister, in every year, submits a report of work done. And that work includes, that work includes road maintenance works. All I am saying is that if you do not want to be addressed according to the color which we all know you are, then when you are making the statement, choose it carefully. What you said was not factual. It was purely political colored, and the facts so, are this. So when, when we, when we get to the, the point, when we get to, you see, no let, let's, let's, no, let's, yes. let, when we get to the point of interrogating this that you are put across, yes, it will be the day for that. Yeah, Today, but, but then, why, then, then yes. when, no, okay, you so see, you, you have, you, you, have, you, you, have you have actually just re responded to him. So exactly. Yes, yes. Yes, it, because so, he made so that let's, point. Let's, which was false. Let's, 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 um, you, you've, I've read. you've, 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 so you've, you've had your time, you've had your time to, you should to be speak. Given a chance so, Elijah Nusaf was saying, because I, I, you I, I, I have served in that into, ministry, <laughs> yes, you have served in that ministry, I decided the, to reserve the right of speaking after uh, Dennis. them I will not for you. I uh, in judgment. Over my successor. <laughs> I, be, be, I definitely, uh, I think that ethically is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. I will not also, I also endeavor not to wear my political hat. I will try to be very honest with that. Yes. As a former roads and highways as a minister. As former uh, roads and highways minister. We all know as a matter of fact that since 2017, the corruption perception index has risen. Ghana is more corrupt today than it was in 2016. Mm -hmm. We do not, we are not presented with the factual evidence of corruption. 
the Transparency International measures perceptions of corruption. As we said today, we know that a minister of a critical infrastructure ministry had one million dollars stolen from her room. She also transacted through her bank accounts amounts ranging to five million dollars. The office of the special prosecutor has retrieved some monies from her residences. It's marks of corruption. It's a perception that the minister having been put in an infrastructure ministry was probably corrupt. And so she's being investigated. Now, this feeds into the narrative. I can tell you, and Dennis knows, Dennis would have heard. Dennis cannot pretend not to have heard that certain ministers receive money in this country. Including past ministers. Yeah, including past ministers. You just cited me as an example. Yeah, where you're 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 no, you just cited me as an no, example. No, it was just a scenario. I didn't. Yes. I didn't. Uh -huh. no, I didn't. Enoch cannot pretend not to have heard. I cannot pretend not to have heard. Just like you. Mm -hmm. All Ghanaians have a certain perception that corruption is on the rise, is on the increase. And that was what Professor Frampong Adai was addressing. He was specific. Now, again, was specific. So again, you allow him to again, make again. A Dennis, Dennis, you see, I'm not referring to you see, no, Dennis, no, Dennis, no, Dennis, no, Dennis, yes, Dennis, yes, yes. Dennis, no, Dennis, Dennis, no, Dennis, no, Dennis, no, Dennis, no, Dennis, Dennis, no, Dennis, Dennis, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You mm. ought, you ought to be very patient. No, he, he can because, because people, the people, the people are listening to us. Dennis, 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 you see, we are, no, but why are you referring to me? He spoke. We are leaders. We are leaders. No, but why? Because, because, just as. Because because we are leaders, we the leadership requires that there's a level of discipline. So address him, not me, he spoke. Now, again, let's come back to it. Today the minister says that they have been so taken aback by what Professor Stephen from uh, Stephen Adai has said mm -hmm. that they have referred the matter to Yoko. But just a few months ago, the minister is reported to have indicted the entire ministry. If a minister says that directors in my ministry are so corrupt and that they are thieves, mm -hmm. and that if we even attempt to sanitize the situation by removing those who are corrupt and are thieves and bring in new people, those people you bring in turn out to be worse. Okay, just to, to put the issue in perspective, take a look at this. We have that video of the minister making this particular statement that you make reference to. This is what the minister said. Take a look. There are a lot of corrupt people. There are a lot of thieves, thieves in my own ministry. You sack them, you employ new ones. And when they come, the new ones are even worse than those that you sack. That is the road and how is minister. Is the minister who has said that. There are two things that we can draw from his statements. One, he knows those who are corrupt and are thieves in his ministry. He knows them. Mm -hmm. And that even he's proceeded to sack some and brought new people. And those new people are more mm -hmm. corrupt. So he knows them. It's a value judgment. Why wasn't the minister referred to Yoko? Why wasn't his statement referred to Yoko? Mm -hmm. Because if we are intent on fighting corruption, or is it part of the general narrative and what we have accepted, that you just say it and walk away? I have said that I will not have impugned the integrity of the directors at the Ministry of Rules and Highways. And I agree with Dennis. Mm -hmm. When you look at the layers, of responsibility in contract in the award of contracts. Sometimes, unless there's a giant conspiracy, giant conspiracy. There's a giant conspiracy in what? They in are the sense that you are going to design the road. Someone must design the road. How you want the road to be? Someone must quantify. Must do the quantities. So we have a quantity surveyor. He says, well, if you want this type of road. This is what will go into 
the road. Then the, someone, materials engineer, then puts values to those quantities that you have provided. And they all together give you the engineer's estimate. That, look, if you want a road done, the minimum, don't go below the, this amount. You should be able to do that road mm -hmm. before you even package the road for award. At what point do you deal with the person who is... And when I was at the minister, Dennis, you didn't need to come to me for... I respected the public procurement law, the tender entity committee's law. Mm -hmm. There were certain projects that I was just informed. The department of... Uh, the Federal Roads Department, the Urban Roads Department, all the highways department had awarded these contracts exactly per their budget. That's mm -hmm. what it still is. Well, so I'm just telling you what I did. Yeah, that's okay. So there was, I'm there was no way. Now. No, I'm just telling but you did, what did, I did. Did, did, did any uh, contractor come to you with, you the, didn't with, need the to concern, come to me. with the concern that there are some people at the ministry who make demands of them I to said pay that money? I stayed in the ministry for two and a half years. My tenure at the Ministry of Rules was two and a half years. I left, I've since left that place for six years now. I'm yet to come across a contractor or information that while I was there, I received money from people. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm not sitting in judgment of a Mankwata. I will, it will be irresponsible on my part to do that. I won't do that. So if we are in bringing in Amakwata, that's your problem. No, no, that's your problem. It's not my problem. It's not my problem. Because I, as a minister who served there, respects the person who is occupying that office. So I won't do that. I will never do that. But oh, the, now, what I wanted to establish is that did you at any point receive any, any concerns by some persons or contractors that there are some people who identify themselves as appointees or staff of the ministry who go and make demands of them to pay monies no i didn't to help them i didn't what the complaints the when i was contract. there the complaints that i received was when the road fund was working and i had people went to pay people's mm -hmm. names continuously came mm -hmm. and uh, the minister and the chairman of the road fund validated the payments so people continuously received money i called the director the, the, the that time not the director the board chairman of the Ghana Highway Authority. And mo the, most of the payments went through Ghana Highway, where to contractors who worked under Ghana. And said, look, I've seen these names appearing almost in every payment. What do you think is happening? He said he would cause an investigation. I also started an investigation. And so I finally referred the matter. I walked myself to the BNI office. I see. He had a meeting with the director and said, the BNI should investigate that. And that stopped the payment. Mm -hmm. Because we had put in a system which we said first come, first in, first out. And so when I was leaving the ministry, the Minister of Energy, I mean the Minister of Roads and Highways did not owe feeder roads through the road fund any money. Ghana Highway owed contractors six months mm -hmm. areas and salary. Six months. And uh, urban roads they had more because they over awarded the contracts and so we were trying to rationalize the award of contract before i left and now since i the minute i left i met the minister i mean as a person who was there before okay and shared with him what i had gone through at the ministry and so no i'm okay. just saying that it is the pronouncement of the minister and what Stephen Adai has said mm -hmm. should be seen as a sequel True. To the pronouncement of the so that's Okay. Well, so uh, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, lawyer Martin people, yeah, at this point, because you see, the issue here is not just um, uh, solely about what uh, Professor Stephen Adair said, and that's what uh, Lajin Safusene is talking about, as a pointer to what has already been complained about. And you made mention some time ago about contractors even coming saying that. Uh, even the monies that they are owed, sometimes they are demanded to pay some money before even the monies that they are owed are paid to them. Is it not? Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's correct. So, listen, uh, we must commend Professor Adair for this bold statement. We must, and yes, we must commend Professor Adair. Look, 
this work is not easy. Fighting corruption, if you say you want to have all the evidence 100% before you speak, like what Dennis uh, Abwadi is now saying, Master, then this fight will get nowhere. Sometimes when the contractors come and tell you these stories, it's sufficient to come out and say it, and we all know it. We all know it's true. Listen, eh, let, let's be very honest with ourselves. You think corruption is fought openly? I mean, like corruption, how it is done? It's done secretly. So the contractor comes to tell you that this is what he had to pay. It's common uh, practice. What Professor Ade has said, I have seen some, I've heard some, and I think that's the right thing that he did. And I like the way Honorable Ibis have seen him put it. Why is it that when Honorable Amwakwata himself accused people in his ministry of corruption, he didn't go to have it investigated? I remember, but I remember on that program, uh, Adam Bona uh, sent a WhatsApp where he said one of the cases, he was part of the committee that investigated. But at least I didn't bring out the, the details. Mm -hmm. But at least that is good. So Adam Bona brought us some details. But that's not all, because the minister said there are thieves meaning there were many okay more than one but i'm gonna testify to one so mm -hmm. the other cases what has the minister done about that i am for this thing further investigation know myself sitting here i remember was it last week or two weeks ago there was another story i heard and then some state institutions are interested i was called that oh can you give further details blah 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 so it's good listen the point is that our democracy thrives on anecdotal evidence. Sometimes you don't get it 100%. But look, let me tell you, Mr. Kansi, and I'm sure viewers know, once this is being discussed this way, the people who collect the bribe, they are put on notice. They become scared. So sometimes when you now go and you want to give, you say, oh, no, 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 hey, people are discussing this. So that discussion has a strong signaling effect. We cannot say that until we are holding the evidence we can't talk about bribery and corruption. No, that's not it. That's not how it is fought. Once there's anecdotal evidence, so when we say anecdotal, so means that it's short of the nine yards that is required in law, but at least there's some sufficient credibility on it, sometimes even in the form of jokes, etc. But we use this to be able to help in the fight against corruption. And look, I remember this incident. You remember when Atamils was president? Mm -hmm. This same roads ministry, you know, Joe Gidisu was minister. There was a, I think, if it's not Pukwasi Road, forgive me, but there was a certain road where the contractor gave him a car. The contract had not been finished. What did Mills do? Mills ordered that the vehicle be returned because at the point, oh, the ministry people came and said, oh, it's a project vehicle, blah, blah, blah. I mean, somehow, naturally, no corruption. People fight back and find all manner of reasons to do a cover-up, right? But the point I'm making is that that same roads ministry, Atamils ordered that Joe Gidisu should return the BMW. I think it was a BMW car. So these things are on and on, and we need them for the fight against corruption. So nobody should tell us that until you are holding the evidence 200%, you can't say it. This is how we've always fought corruption, that we use anecdotal evidence to push back. You need to push back whilst you look for 100% evidence. After all, don't you even see that Madame Dapai's case, they are putting up a fight saying it's not corruption. But at least you see that, even though it's not been proven in court, we are using it for our weekly discussions and it's shaping our democracy. So my point is that the anecdotal evidence is good in shaping our democracy. If you take out this anecdotal evidence, then there will be nothing left. You can't gag us. And this is one of the points we must repeat with all emphasis. Mm -hmm. You see that the worst performance of... Uh, President Mama on corruption, the 43, uh, uh, 43. That's the best that Ikufuado made, right? On the fight against corruption. Is that not correct? Mm -hmm. That's according to the uh, Corruption Perception Index, yes. Yes, the worst performance, 43, that JM got, that's Ikufuado's best thing. And you think we shouldn't talk about corruption? Who born dog? Who born dog? We have to, with our anecdotal evidence. And anecdotal evidence was used whilst uh, this thing, MPP was in opposition. Let's remember this. The Kumasi airport, Dennis, he let him answer. What didn't they say about Kumasi airport? Hey, the contract is overinflated. It's corruption. Kumasi airport, too. rich hospital, all of them, as we see today, who has been put before court for corruption on the rich hospital project? 
who has been put before court for corruption on the Kumasi uh, airport. Ah, why are we kids? Why is Dennis gaslighting us that we've soon forgotten? And I believe those things. When mm -hmm. Dennis and Code were in opposition and we were saying that the bridge was the project was inflated or was corruption. And I believed it when they said the Kumasi International uh, District, uh, Airport, the expansion, mm -hmm. there was corruption. They even said the money that was used for the Kumasi one, we could have used uh, what? We could have used it for three airports, three brand new airports. They were mentioning some figures and something from Turkey. And it sounded very sweet. It was very sweet. And today, Dennis is saying what? Today, Dennis is saying what? We shouldn't use anecdotal evidence. Oh, come on. He should spare us, please. He should spare us. We will continue to use anecdotal evidence. And it's not just in Ghana, everywhere. Anecdotal evidence is very, 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 very critical in fighting corruption because right. corruption is not done openly and people are often not willing to come in and okay. give you the evidence. Indeed, and that's where the challenge really lies, is not? And to encourage people to boldly step up, isn't it? To help in the fight against corruption. Thank you very much, Martin Pebo. And we'll be back shortly after this quick break and get into our final issue, which is very important because we've seen some chaos in the distribution of relief items to these uh, affected persons, which is not looking good. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Boga Fortuna Bo! Boga Fortuna Ya Bigo! Mabagana, Mabagana! No, 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 Mabagana! Who is going to drive at the end? They get their drive to go free! Fortuna Bo! Hey! Hey, I'm busy, I'm busy! 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 This is Bigo Cola! I taste in here, big! This is so refreshing. <laughs> You've never changed your value. Oh no. Let's make the party begin. Let's go. Bigo cola. Bigo cola. How? Bigo cola. You don't want them. They come. I don't want them. Cola for the party. Ah, Bigo for your hunger. Join the big refreshing moment with Bigo cola. Bigo. This outfit is FDA approved. Feel adrift as you transition into a new stage of your life. The future seems like a blank space until you discover the passion within. The canvas of the future is yours to paint. Welcome to a world of opportunities. Heritage Christian College, offering world class university education, training compassionate entrepreneurial leaders. The Ghana Journalists Association welcomes you to the 27th GJA Media Awards, a night of networking and recognizing achievements themed leveraging media freedom to sustain the democratic and security architecture. The litmus test of election 2024. Keynote speaker, Mrs. Jean Mensah, Chairperson, Electoral Commission, Chairman, Reverend Dr. Ernest Edujemfi, Chairman, National Peace Council, Special Guests of Honor, Honorable Opon Krumah, Minister for Information, and her Excellency Virginia E. Palmer, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana. Join us at the 27th GJA Media Awards as we celebrate excellence at the Accra International Conference Center, Sunday, October 29th, 2023, 3 p.m. sharp. Lead sponsor, GCB Bank. Major sponsors, U.S. Embassy, KGL, Ghana Gas, ADB Bank, Yoko, and Tobinko. Supporting sponsors, Ghana Police Service, Stambig Bank, Access Bank, GBC, National National Security, Kapoha, SNIT, Innerlink, and Ghana Shippers Authority, powered by the GJA and Glow Productions.
This is Hot Issues, your passport to the most compelling conversations of our time. We go one-on-one -on -one with the movers and shakers, the thought leaders and the game changers. We ask the questions that matter and we don't back down. Tonight on Hot Issues, I sit with the man at the center of corruption investigations. Join me on Hot Issues here on TV3. Hot Issues shows Sundays at 2 p.m. on TV3. TV3. Welcome back to Key Point. We're live on 3FM 92.7, also on TV3 Gun on Facebook. Now, this week, we witnessed a rather worrying uh, development with uh, the people who have been displaced as a result of the flooding caused by the spillage of the excess water from the Akonsombo and the Akbong dams. The chaos. Take a look at this. One of the safe havens, not too safe. One of the safe havens, not too safe. And so persons living with disability can't even get in. Even abled individuals can't get their hands on some of the items. How much more persons living with disability? Let me quickly engage. That's just a bit of the chaos we witnessed. This was at the St. Kizito uh, shelter or the safe haven. Uh, for the people who have been displaced in Mepe, specifically. Uh, Ken Alfeso Sabwaje, retired, is a security analyst and has some extensive experience in uh, understanding of how disaster must be managed in the most effective way. Ken Alfeso Sabwaje is joining us on Zoom. I thank you, Ken Alf. Good morning to you. Now, uh, th this chaos uh, that, that we, we witnessed this week and what we've just shown, now, what should have been done the best way possible or should be done going forward to ensure that even if individuals show up with their relief items, this is a safe haven. What should have not been seen of NATMO in putting the systems and structures in place to effectively coordinate some of these instances so as to avoid this chaos we are seeing? Hello, Kenel, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm yes. getting some message from Great. your studio. Um, immediately, what becomes obvious is a lack of coordination um, by the lead agency, in this case, NADMO, and to some extent also VRA. So because NADMO had not been able from the start of the spillage to set up the safe havens under its management and to send out messages or communication to all the entities and individuals willing to provide aid, to channel the aid through uh, NADMO. That is the reason why that particular chaos at, I believe, St. Kizito in Mepe happened. It also happened because I think those individuals or entities who were providing the aid had not contacted the community leaders. And I think the appropriate way in the absence of NADMO being in charge is for individuals, when they get to the communities, to get in touch with the community leaders hand over the items to the community leaders and then participate in the distribution. But if they go around, as we did during the COVID, with food from trucks, buckets, blankets, mattresses, and other you know, materials directly distributing to the community, you end up with this. The danger in what we saw as a chaos, even in the absence of the chaos is that when relief materials, especially in this humanitarian emergency situation is not carefully coordinated, you get a situation where a community or some communities get more than their fair share 
of the scarce relief materials to the detriment of others who don't get enough or don't get at all. And I think a good example in this case would be Aveyume, which during this week complained that the aid had not uh, reached them. True. But if you take a step back, you take a step further back, the whole idea is that after the simulation in May, structures like the Interministerial Committee should have been established because that is where the strategic direction and coordination starts from. Not necessarily in May, but any time between May and 15 <coughs> September, when the spillage started, NADMO should have been on the ground together with the Interministerial Committee. Now we all know that whether the people heeded the warning to move or not, by the time they got to the safe havens, NADMO was not there. We saw clearly, we are seeing clearly that these displaced persons initially and probably up till now are staying in facilities without doors, without windows, without tentage, and in humanitarian assistance, what we call uh, wash, the water, the sanitation, sanitation and the and hygiene. hygiene. These are critical aspects of humanitarian emergencies. They were not there. That even this week, media showed that people were poo pooing into plastic bags and throwing them into the you know stagnant water. Mm -hmm. so that is the reason why we're having all of these challenges. And in short, I'm saying that government was not prepared for this disaster. That's as simple as that. If government had prepared after the simulation, whether there were lapses in the simulation or not, whether communities were involved, and let's not forget that the simulation involved only three out of the nine districts. It's North Tongu that is mentioned in the simulation report. It is Adan, and I think it is um, a third one. You see, it? just three out of nine districts. And remember, a simulation does not cover the entire geographical area of a, of, of, of a district. Mm -hmm. So it's just a small sample that you take. And that small sample may not be representative. Definitely not across all the nine districts. And we're talking of even the downstream. We've not brought in uh, the upstream. So a lot of things have not gone well. So I have information, for instance, mm -hmm. that the Navy on their own initiative, the Ghana Navy on their own initiative or on its own initiative, stood by from the 5th, I think, of October because the chief of the Naval Star, again, of, of his own accord or probably upon the direction of the CDS, had taken to the air to look at the extent of you know the the water builder behind the dam and mm -hmm. then downstream and that was when he decided to put the naval assets we have on the water including the sogakope naval uh, training command on standby that was the fifth but the navy deployed its assets 10 boats and 80 personnel or 50 personnel with 30 in reserve were deployed on the 16th because then it appears that it was on the 16th that some executive order came through that the situation was getting out of control and therefore the navy should deploy and probably at about the same time the 48th engineer regiment also came with their six boats you see it mm -hmm. So the coordination was woefully absent. The Ghana National Fire Service took part in the simulation. Ghana Police Service plus the Ghana Police Service Marine Unit took part. The Ambulance Service took part. Uh, which other agencies? You know, quite a number of them. But we all know that. When the water spillage started and engulfed facilities, there were patients who could not be moved. There were the elderly, the aged, the women, pregnant children, you know, uh, the infirm or physically challenged, 
all needed help. So to say that we did a simulation and we issued an alert, let's note on the 12th of September also, what was issued was not an order to move. It was an alert that there were going to be a control spillage was imminent. Mm. You see, I mean, if you read English, they mean two different things. Spillage is imminent without any definitive time when you were going to spill. He said that in the next uh, one or two days, if the volume of the water continued to rise at that rate that they had monitored, you see, mm -hmm. this warning was not specific. Nadmo Vieri didn't know the total number of people who were supposed to be displaced. Now, right. that should have been part of the assessment coming from the simulation. Now we know that there are about 40,000. But we also remember that during the first week of the disaster, mm -hmm. NADMO was talking about 6,000, 8,000. Right. It is only this week well, that NADMO is talking about registration. So for several weeks, definitely four to five weeks, NADMO was not in control of how many people had been displaced, of what genders, of what age groups, you know, uh, by, as we say, disaggregated. <laughs> that's so, a, yes, go ahead. A clear concern there, and that's why I wanted to um, uh, bring in Dennis Miracles Abwaji on this matter. Because you see, the, all the lapses that Ken Officer Abwaji retired has identified are evident and points to the fact that there was a lack of adequate preparation for this, even though the warning signs were very clear on the wall. This is where we are now. What has to be done? Well, I mean, I, I have been to, to the zone, and I have seen with my eyes what's going on there. I've also been in touch with a lot of the MDCs in the area, and so I know. I know very much what's, what's happening there and, and what happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, even those of us in Accra who get our homes flooded sometimes when it rains, you can imagine the, the discomfort and let alone the current situation that our brothers and sisters in that area are going through. I think I would want to focus on how we can quickly resolve their situation for them and assist to, to return their lives to normalcy. I think that, for me, will be critical at this point. Usually, in disasters like this, you would want to restore people, and then afterwards you do your post analysis and, and, and report and make sure that we do better going into the future. Whatever it is, however you look at it, you can never be completely ready for situations like this. You can only seek to improve okay. upon how you do it. And I am very happy with how corporate Ghana individuals you know, are coming in to support. I mean, even in superpower countries, when they experience disasters, People come in to support. I mean, recently in Turkey, when they had the earthquake, even Ghana had to go and send reliefs. Individuals flew in reliefs. Um, Sierra Leone or Senegal went through the years, you know. So I think that what we need to do at this point okay. is to really encourage a lot more support and relief um, items for, for these communities. Uh, do we have a disaster fund in place as a country? Yeah, we are a house. So but as we speak, I mean, I mean, VRA has, as we speak, as we speak. Mm -hmm. And then um, I know that VRA has okay. already committed 10 million, you know, to, to support. Government has also committed 40 million to restore their local economic in, 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 in these areas. So efforts are being made. And so um, a lot more call for support from corporate Ghana, from individuals, from non-governmental organizations. It can never be enough. Because even before the disaster, these are communities that were in need for a lot more social services, let alone being uh, struck with such a disaster. Okay. It can never be enough. When we Indeed. are done, then we can go. Because for, for me, I have questions. You, have you know, VRA has questions to answer um, in terms of, so we don't know how much rain will come next year. Indeed. So what's going to happen? Uh, and, we and don't know when again this will be a, a necessity. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Those are is things that we need to. Indeed. And uh, Prof. Yeah. Yes, I think these are borders on lack of specificities. You know, there are many specifics that are lacking in assessment in when 
they saw that there was going to be a spillage where the people inform appropriately, were evacuation, you know, routes given, and then poor judgment has landed us to this. I believe, and I agree with him, that we should give the people hope, some hope. And if you, let's, I like the, the Italian word for empathy. It means walking into. So how do we walk into the homes of Bato and uh, Mape and Mafi and Adidome and mm -hmm. Sogakope to see what people are going through? You know, daily lives, what they're, I'm, I'm told that even, you know, fishing is at risk, irrigation is no more, uh, cops are uh, the mortuaries are getting rotten. So you can see that there are a lot of health issues, environmental issues going on there. And from the East Legon Executive Club to the Zimbala Unit Committee members, we should all find a way to mobilize resources to help. I believe that, you know, my university, Academic City, uh, University College that I'm a dean, we have instituted a fund that we are all donating. I've donated money. Mm -hmm. Individuals, our president, okay. and, and everybody has donated right. money to just to go and support. But in a situation like that, we, we share what we call the best practices in the world. Okay. U.S. have always the national guard that any time there's an issue like this, immediately they move in to help. I believe that moving forward, we should have something like this in, in, in line so that when there's this situation, we can put it in check earlier instead of causing that extensive damage to the Allow people. Yourself, well, I, th I think that uh, it's a matter of concern. It's a worry that, I mean, it, we were caught on the words. We have been told that there were stimulation exercises carried out. Uh, but we don't know uh, to what purpose, because the, uh, the whole area has been inundated by water. People are going through untold hardships. Uh, they, they, it, in fact, government was a little bit slower in its response. Uh, uh, and up to now, I don't know where the response has come. Uh, private individuals have responded timelessly to getting the people out of their predicament. And I think that all of us have a duty to help save the people, to help bring the people back to life, in the sense that to help uh, them I mean, adjust to what has happened to them. And that's a very, very important call. And that's why for us here at Media General, we continue to call on you to, to help us as we put our hands together to also help these people. And everyone here at Media General, we've contributed a little to, to led by the CEO and management. And then also the many, many of you who have also come through to help us. Thank you very much. The relief items, we've sent a, a few of them and every day we'll be sending to all the places, not just the Volta region. We have um, Adan, some parts of Adan as well have been affected. About 241 communities in Keta, we understand, have also been affected. So we'll do all of that. So please, if you have any contributions, mobile money number 059-743-110, 059-743-110. Appreciate your time. Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Professor Eno Kenji, Dennis Marcos Abouji, Alajino Safuseni, and Ken Ofesso Abouji, retired. Appreciate your time. Thank you. On behalf of the rest of the team, uh, led by Atukwamana Hazel, Harriet Asunda, Mary Sasari and everybody on duty today. Thank you so much for staying with us. I am Alfred Akonsi. Have a great weekend.